All right, Mary. So the first one is the uh, <clears throat> Town of Waitley pump station application. Okay. Is this is just a continuation? So there's nothing for me to read. Right? Nothing for you to read. Just yeah. uh, <clears throat> wanted you to be on board. All right. So I just emailed everybody a few documents that were sent in today that I wasn't here to receive. <laughs> uh, so there's stuff in your email. <laughs> no, we saw them come in, Mary. Thank okay. you. So from my perspective, uh, we've continued this a number of times. The genesis of that was we had our first hearing, we had a view of the premises. And then I asked the question whether the landowners had um, signed anything in um, or with with the town of Waitley for using their property for the easement purposes. And the answer was no, but the negotiations were underway and they were close to finalizing the negotiations. And so that continued to be the um, scenario as we continued this from month to month until during August, there was some communication uh, perhaps from Brian that we, we, or the applicant needed to get this done before the cold weather came about. So I then suggested that rather than a full blown easement signed by both sides, <clears throat> which was never what I really had wanted in the first place. I just wanted an acquiescence that the landowner um, was in agreement that it, this petition could be sought for a special permit on their land, because that's been an issue that we've been seeing. And I think it's going to be an issue again tonight on some of these other hearings. So what I said was, whatever the legal issues are that you're preventing you from getting the easement signed, just get us either a memor of, memorandum of understanding, a letter of intent, uh, or some acknowledgement that <clears throat> the landowners in agreement with this uh, special permit being sought and they got something. Okay, so Lucy, you can take over from there. Okay, um, yes, so we have a final um, stamp easement plan and we have a memorandum of, of agreement. Um, they've also uh, finalized the language for the official agree easement agreement, but um, it's, not, it's not fully signed. So, um, I can share and show you the easement plan if um, if you'd like. Okay, and, and let me let me just, documents. Um, I think I'm. I think you can do that, Lucy. But if you can't, let me know. Let's see. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, you are now a co-host. Lucy, is this one of the documents that you sent today? Um, I. Uh, I didn't send anything today, but um, maybe yesterday. Oh, uh, it might be yesterday. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. Let me just see. Let's see. So when I hit share screen, oh, there we go. Yep, you should be able to do it. Yep. Okay. Oh, this this says you, you sent something to me and Don. Oh, right. I have that on my screen. You, want, you too. wanted the. Uh, the site plan conditions. Yes, and and th okay. thank you, Mary. Okay. I um, I also have that up ready to share if we need it. Thanks. Um, I thought maybe that would be relevant. So okay. Here here's the um, the easement uh, plan, um, which is finalized and and stamped by our surveyor. Um, and so here's the parcel. Uh, here you know. Oops, sorry. There's the um. Easement, which is the this is the property line with the cemetery and um, North Street, and so it's the southeast corner of uh, Quant Quant Farm. We're not seeing it. You, you, don't see, you don't see this, Roger. I see it. I can see it. I can see it. I think I'm frozen partially. Can yes, you, you are, Roger. You're actually oh. you're, you're blanked out. Um, he should log out and come back in. That's yeah, log, yeah, that's the only way to do it. Oh my gosh. 
<laughs> oh, Lucy, you know this, what? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid if if he logs out to come back in, he's oh, there. I am. Oh, are you back? Yeah. Okay. I'm back. All right, Lucy. Good. Lucy, this is the revised plan. Uh, what's the date on it, please? Can you tell me that? Uh, on this, um, this is dated August twenty fourth, uh, twenty twenty one. Thank you. And it's the um, proposed pump station easement. And so, Roger, um, uh, this is the property line with the cemetery and Quan Quan Farm. And so the easement is located on the southeast corner of Quan Quan Farm. And um, the memorandum of agreement is, is, um, is, is here. Uh, it was signed on uh, Tuesday, the 31st. Um, let's see. And so, um, I, I'm not sure which part is you would like to see, but uh, this Quant Quant Farm will convey a perpetual um, permanent exclusive easement um, for the purpose of installing, maintaining, repairing, and replacing a pumping station, access there to and free to them. Yeah, that, that's mainly what we wanted to see. Okay. And so uh, there's some, this is actually very much the language in the, in the, in the actual agreement. Um, you said the easement presence, and then um, just to go so, and it's signed by um, both parties. Yeah, I think that's great. Cool. So um, there were also some other um, uh, considerations when we left this off. Um, with regard to, from the cemetery commission and the historical commission. And um, in May, we, the planning board also had those, um, had uh, uh, wanted to uh, consider all those issues also and did so in their site plan review in May. Um, and we issued a, uh, a revision to our site plan to address, um, to address some of those comments. Um, so I'll share again and show you um, what was presented to the planning board um, in consideration of those, the issues. Um, so this is the revised site plan. We moved the propane tank. It was at the rear of the site here. Oh, right. And yeah. We moved it to the closer to the front of the site, such that it would be easier to access um, for filling. Uh, secondly, this was uh, an asphalt driveway, and um, this is just a construction entrance. So now uh, we got rid of the asphalt um, driveway. The water department will use the existing gravel drive. Um, and then we also, uh, we're putting a new power pole here and putting the electricity underground to the building. And um, last was we relocated the, this is the distribution main to the water district customers. And um, it was within a, a, a bunch of vegetation and trees and we've moved it out here to the north edge of the gravel drive. And so, um, like I said, in May, uh, the, um, we, the, the site plan review was approved by the planning board. Um, and um, they, they had some conditions related to um, the cemetery, um, the, the access road and, and some conditions on it. to answer some of the uh, Sanitary and Historical Commission comments. Lucy, could you give me the date of this plan too? Of the, um, the, of the revised site plan? Yeah. Um, 
just so I can keep track of what we're yes. doing today. It was uh, revised. So it was originally April. Well, just, just the revision. The revision is May 11th, 2021. Thank you. No, I'm at my meeting. Let's see. Yeah. Anything else you want us to consider, Lucy? Um, that's pretty much all the, the the background and the new new events. Good. Any member of the public who wishes to be heard? Okay. Any member of the board have questions? I do not. I do not. Fred, any questions? Oh, it looks it looks good for me. It looks like everybody has been involved and reached agreements to everybody's satisfaction. So, <clears throat> okay. Well, then why don't we um, do our formal uh, closing of the public dialogue section? So I'll move to close the public dialogue section of the meeting. Second. I would vote to approve the um, petition. It's in the public interest to be sure. And um, so the planning board had a number of uh, conditions on there. Those seem satisfactory. I don't think we need to duplicate those. So I think we need to approve it if we're so inclined. And like I said, I would vote in favor. I, I would as well and use the planning board's conditions. Do you I think, to, but, do, do, but Deb, do you think we need to re, repeat them or just let them stand on their own? And oh, I, I agree with you, Roger. I'm sorry. Yes, let them there. That's a separate board with those conditions. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Fred? Right. Yeah, I would, I would vote to approve the, uh, the agreement. Okay. All right. Then we are uh, unanimous. It's a three uh, zero vote. Lucy will write it up as quickly as we can and um, good luck. Thank, thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, we're right on schedule with our agenda. We have a minute to spare. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Mayor, we, we must have the minutes from May, don't we? That, that deals with the original. <laughs> I think we do. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't tell you which oh, one you have. We can look uh, for we'll, we'll track it down. I'm, I'm pretty sure we have them. Let me see what I've got here. I have, I'm, I'm, I have this memory of having seen the minutes from May. Yeah, I do too, because Sovereign Builders was in there. And right. We were looking at it. From that okay, I, minutes from May 6th. Looks like we only had one May meeting, so that must be it. They're, they I have them under approved minutes. So they were already approved by the board. Did oh, you want them to refer to? Is that posted on the uh, on the website? Uh, not yet. Okay. But if Deborah wants to share them from my screen, that's fine. Well, I don't. I don't think we need them now. We just, okay. We'll need them to write it up. When we write up, yeah. Oh, yeah. I I see what you mean for for the <laughs> yeah in order to do the decision. Yes, we have those. Okay. Good. Well, so, if you're ready, excuse me, but did Bob, were you not here last time? Did you not vote tonight? I was not present for the any of the 
a discussion about the pump station. Okay, that's what I, I thought was happening here. Mary, we'll launch into the seven o'clock hearing. Which one is that? I haven't got the uh, right here with me. Uh, debilitating. Okay. 424 State Road. Yeah. Okay, we can go ahead. All right, well, do we have the parties here on the debilitating hearing? I have DMCPC is here. Isaac Fleischer from Bacon Wilson is here. And Jared Glansberger from DMC. And Chris Chamberlain, Berkshire Design. Well, we trust these guys. Excuse me, uh, I, I can't get all those names and some people are just here with phone numbers. Um, Jared, I got you. Chris Chamberlain, was that you? Yes. Okay. I'm here. And Isaac Fleischer from Bacon Wilson is on the phone. And Isaac, I got him, yep. I'll be, I'll be switching from phone to video in about three minutes. Okay. Bill Swayze from Yankee Candles also on. Anyone from Tour of Verde? Uh, yes, uh, Dick Evans for uh, Tour of Verde. Okay, so we got um, memoranda from each side prepared by their legal counsel. Now. Dick, you sent an email earlier, late afternoon, and it said there was an attachment, but I didn't see an attachment. Oh, oh, gosh. It, was, it wasn't there. Oh, uh, sorry. I will send it, resend it right away and send it to Mary. Um, well, actually, would, if you have it, I can make you a co-host and you can share it. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, let's wait. Let's when we wait. get to it. Let's wait okay. till we get there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So... Why don't we hear from the petitioner first and or their counsel as to um, what they want to have us consider on the parking and the traffic issues. Uh, and so I guess I'll defer right. I, yeah, since I, you prepared the memo. Yeah, I can, I can summarize uh, the memo. I, I mean, as you all recall at the last meeting, uh, Toro Verde uh, brought up concerns about um, traffic and, and parking at the site. Um, and in the memo, I, I try to break up um, the, the parking issues sort of into uh, two different considerations. Uh, one consideration is, is whether or not this special permit is compliant with the zoning ordinance. And then the other um, consideration is that is is uh, practically speaking, what's what is the actual um, parking needs? So regarding the uh, the zoning ordinance, um, as as we discussed last time, um, a, a retail use, whether it's marijuana or other retail, uh, is treated the same for parking requirements into the zoning ordinance, and that's uh, one space per 150 square feet, and um, we we took a look we took a look at uh, the the square footage of uh, of our proposed permit, um, and we took a look at the square footage of Toro Verde's uh, approved permit. 
and um, while I'm I'm in my car right now, the I believe it was something like uh, the aggregate of those two uses required. I, I think it was uh, somewhere in the low twenties uh, for parking spaces. Um, now the the zoning ordinance, as uh, as Dick Evans pointed out at the last meeting, does require a um, it, it requires that the that the use is compliant with all the parking requirements um, of the site as a whole. And um, we we kind of we had to look at what is that what does that mean the site as a whole. And uh, the site is as we know it's a it's a condominium with three different units. Um, currently there are they're all vacant. Uh, there's no current uses. Um, so we're looking at, at what's been permitted and that's Torre Verde and what's being proposed, that would be DMC. Um, if the entire site were filled um, with, with retail, it would come to uh, more than the, I believe, 89. So 87, now I'm stopped. I can, I can look at my memo. 87 parking spaces in all. And if it was, if the entire site was used for um, for retail, it would re it would require uh, 109 spaces. So the it was built originally um, that 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 kind of mini it was built without enough parking. Um, so there is a there there there's an impossibility to fill it completely without um, without special. Uh, Without a variance from the um, from the ZBA, but it would be completely impractical to to interpret the uh, the zoning ordinance language to mean that no space can get a no use can get a special permit unless the entire area can be filled to its maximum with the with any hypothetical use. Yeah. Um, that would have that I mean certainly it, to interpret it that way. Torre Verde would never be able to have a special permit there. Uh, and in fact, uh, no retail use would be able to get a special permit there. Um, so we're, we are, look, we are taking a holistic analysis of the site in terms of the use as of the time that we're applying for a special permit. Um, and there's plenty of parking left over uh, for other uses going forward. Then in terms of just the practical, uh, the, the practical use, uh, and the parking needs. Uh, Berkshire Design put together an excellent analysis that, that was presented at our last meeting. Um, and it's been updated since that meeting. You've all received a copy of it. The, the updates include um, consideration for potential uses uh, for the for building. I think it's, it's unit C, I believe. It's the smallest unit that was previously um, analyzed as, uh, as just storage space now Berkshire Design has done an analysis, um, including that unit as a, as office space. So, so Berkshire Design's analysis takes into account the two marijuana uses, and then uh, assumes the rest of it, the rest of the site, is filled with office space because that would be allowed uh, by right. It would not require another special permit. And their analysis came up with. Uh, I mean, they used they used a number of different scenarios, but the the most likely scenarios ranged from uh, 59 to 62 parking spaces needed, um, and then they did what they called a worst case scenario, and that that scenario assumes that um, that the standard the standard uh, calculations for marijuana establishments vastly underestimate the parking needs. And even even in that kind of worst case scenario estimate, they came up with uh, parking uh, parking requirements of 75 spaces. Um, so I also in the memo addressed, you know, how realistic is that worst case scenario that it would be that we're underestimating parking needs, and uh, most likely it would we're actually overestimating parking needs for marijuana establishments. Um, the number of re marijuana retailers in Massachusetts has increased exponentially just within the last year. Uh, there's now 169 retail establishments 
that have uh, received final licenses from the CCC. And about a quarter of them are right here in uh, Hampshire and Franklin County. Um, so the likelihood of um, having a situation like what was seen in Northampton when, uh, when Netta was one of the first retailers in the state to open up, um, that's just extremely unlikely. Um, and then the other, the other thing that, that uh, Tora Verde brought up as a concern was, was traffic. Um, and, you know, the, the, the traffic data that we, uh, that we submitted, it was put together by Berkshire Design. It's exactly uh, the same company that Tora Verde used and relied on the same data uh, for their special permit. Uh, and in both cases, the conclusion was that um, it would be it, it would not have any uh, substantial impact on on traffic in the area. Okay, thanks. Any questions the board has? Yes, Roger. Yes, um, I was wondering, Chris, um, where does the snow go? Generally, when I look at parking lots of retail establishments throughout the Northeast, some of the parking spaces disappear in the winter because of snow. And um, did anybody look into that? Did anybody ask what happens when we have a substantial snowfall? Do spaces disappear? And therefore, does that fluctuation present a problem? Um, so I, I suspect that actually, John Bonavita can probably answer better than I can, but looking at the site, um, there is a large- uh, I'm sorry, Bill, Bill Swayze from uh, Yankee oh, Candle great. is also here. Perfect. Yeah, <clears throat> so I've got a vast amount of experience plowing that lot and there is uh, ample grass space, uh, especially on our side of the building to push it both south and east. Uh, and not lose any parking spots. So we've never had an issue when Bay State Medical was there uh, leasing from us with any types of, you know, snow removal and losing parking spots. Thank you. All right, so then um, there's no other questions from the board. Are there any questions from the public for uh, debilitating on this on these two issues. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be heard if I could. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm Richard Evans, and I'm a lawyer in Northampton and represent Toro Verde, who is the uh, tenant in Building A, uh, who expects to open a, a 5,000 square foot marijuana retail facility uh, sometime this fall and uh, hopes to lease, lease out the rest of their the space in their building, uh, the remaining 3,000 square feet to a restaurant or some other retail use. Uh, also on the, in the room here, uh, I believe are other members of the Toro Verde team. I'd just like to acknowledge them. Uh, uh, the president, Billy Beats, I think is with us and uh, principal uh, Neil Maruka and as well as a uh, consultant who's well known to all of us, uh, Stan Rosenberg. Yeah. Who's... Sorry? I think somebody needs to mute if they're not speaking. It's ancillary noise. Okay. Okay. I was just going to say that introducing the other members of the team, uh, Billy Beats, Neil Morocco, and Stan Rosenberg has helped us as a consultant in this case, and he may be on the line as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think there are two issues before the board here. One is whether the site can legally accommodate two marijuana shops. And the other one is whether the site can practically accommodate two marijuana shops. With regard to the first question, I think the answer is quite clearly no, as the Whateley zoning code uh, clearly requires around 107, 109, so forth for, for both shops. And then uh, the plaza only has 84 spots of which 84 have been counted already toward Tor Verde's use of building A, uh, leaving only about 30 spaces is about half of what uh, debilitating needs. So their debilitating's analysis, Mr. Chairman, I think not only ignores 
the uh, the one space per 150 square foot rule in, in Article Three, Article Four. I'm sorry, the zoning code. It also ignores the uh, the entire property rule in Article Five. It's simply beyond the authority of this board to grant a special permit when the criteria have not been satisfied and the criteria for zoning are simply not satisfied. Now, as to the second issue, whether the site can practically accommodate two, two marijuana shops, we asked a civil engineer to take a look at the Berkshire Design Group's evaluations. And uh, he concluded that it's not at all clear that there is sufficient parking uh, based on ITE data and, and other, and other uh, materials, which I will ask him to uh, explain if you'd like to chat with him. I think he is in the room. His name is uh, Kim has a Vartarian uh, and he's available to answer any questions. I'll, I'll, I'll put his uh, report up on the screen here. Um, um, at this moment, I need to make you a co-host. Hang okay. on for a moment. Okay, you can do that now. Okay. Um, are, are you, do you see the screen? Not uh, yet. What do I have to do? You need to go to share screen which you may find at the bottom. Oh, oh, yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um. Yes, you see? No, okay, now it's coming up. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, Kim, are you in the room? He was in the room. He may need to unmute. Can everybody hear me? Oh, there yeah. you are. Yes. Thank you, Kim. Uh, please introduce yourself and give the board a real quick run through of your report. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Kim Hazavardi and I'm a principal engineer uh, with TEP LLC. Uh, I'm a transportation engineer and uh, I uh, put together a memorandum uh, with my opinions at this point in them. Uh, and uh, let's see if you could uh, scroll to the top and uh, go down to my qualifications. Okay, just uh, because you folks probably don't know me, uh, I've uh, been a uh, transportation engineer for uh, over 40 years. Uh, went to school at the University of Kansas and uh, UMass Amherst, uh, and uh, the rest of my qualifications were in the memo. Uh, and uh, just, uh, I've got a question, uh, Dick, does everybody have access to the memo? Does everybody have their own uh, electronic copy or whatever? It should be on everyone's screen right now. Okay, in that case, uh, I'm going to, uh, okay, so what they're seeing, I'm seeing basically, right? Exactly. That's correct, yes. Excuse me, I, I just need to interject that because we're reviewing it at this meeting, I, the secretary, also need to have a, a copy, either paper or electronics for the files. I, I don't, maybe um, someone has already sent it. Uh, I don't know that, but if we, we need to have all this in our possession at some point. So that Yes, Mar Mary, I'll see that you get a copy right away. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, briefly, there's a list of uh, what I looked at. Uh, I looked at uh, the application for special permit, uh, including especially uh, the traffic uh, evaluation. I looked at the revised uh, parking uh, evaluation from Berkshire Design Group. I uh, looked at the site plan showing uh, the three buildings and the square footage, including uh, the upper and lower levels. Uh, I looked at uh, pertinent sections of the uh, Waitley zoning bylaws. And then I looked at two references from the Institute of Transportation Engineers, uh, the trip generation manual and the parking generation, both uh, parking generation manual, both of which Berkshire Design Group also used. Uh, some uh, factors in my review, uh, building A, that's been licensed and permitted for a retail marijuana store, having square footage of 5,000 square feet, probably opening uh, later this year. And that leaves 3,000 square feet in the building uh, that the tenant has expressed interest in uh, subleasing as a restaurant. Uh, another uh, consideration, uh, we have two marijuana stores uh, on a single site at a busy intersection. Uh, it is 
an atypical situation? Is it absolutely unheard of? No, there are, there are some rare instances, but it's uh, not a typical situation. Uh, and uh, complete data, information, or analysis hasn't been provided to fully and properly assess parking demand or traffic impacts. That means looking at the uh, increment of parking increase and tra traffic increase due to the project, and also looking at uh, parking and traffic in a holistic manner for the whole site. Uh, another factor is the location. It's uh, on a, a busy corridor, uh, Route 5 uh, and uh, Route 10, typo in my uh, memorandum, uh, State Road. Uh, there are a number of attractions uh, along uh, the corridor, Yankee Candle, Magic Winds Butterfly Conservatory, uh, Historic Deerfield, soon the Treehouse Brewery, multiple other commercial uses. Uh, it's a busy area with visitors coming uh, and uh, there's uh, that signalized intersection sitting at the corner of the site. Uh, now, what we didn't consider, but maybe a consideration are the lower levels in uh, buildings A and B. Uh, Notwithstanding the, the uh, concept that portions of building B might have uh, some uh, lower level uh, area uh, finished off. I'm not sure on that, but that might be the case. Uh, the, uh, the main point I want to make here is uh, we've been talking about square footage on that main level uh, and uh, the lower level uh, hasn't come into play in terms of traffic or parking. Um, now uh, my conclusions. Uh, we have a couple of uh, significant concerns in the uh, BDG Berkshire Design Group evaluation. Um, uh, could and you, um, could you scroll down, please, to the conclusions. One is uh, the parking generation rate for uh, marijuana dispensary was not used. Uh, usually, when we look at parking generation for a site, we use a parking generation rate uh, that. Uh, has as, some, as an input some independent variable uh, like square footage or number of employees. Uh, in this case, uh, a blanket number of 16 spaces was used uh, both for uh, the, uh, the proposed marijuana facility and, the, and uh, actually uh, when the applicant for the proposed uh, marijuana facility looked at the already approved marijuana <laughs> facility, they just used a number of 16 per facility uh, without considering whether uh, the floor area or anticipated customer and employee activity um, influence the parking generation. That's not typical professional practice where parking needs tend to vary based on those variables like floor area, employee activity, customer activity, or some other appropriate variable. Uh, another concern is uh, that the evaluation um, doesn't uh, fully consider local zoning requirements the town of Waitley requires that every 150 square feet of retail or office space has a one parking space. Uh, and um, the applicant is suggesting departing from that uh, without, uh, without seeking the zoning variance where, where this relief might be relevant. Uh, and uh, the evaluation is not at the point where it should be relied upon to submort, submit a, a departure from local requirements. Uh, BD, uh, BDG is correct to point out that the marijuana industry is relatively new. Uh, and uh, because of that, um, analysis of marijuana dispensaries with regard to traffic impact and parking demand is likewise relatively new and therefore should require close examination by the town. And uh, the overarching recommendation of TEP LLC, my recommendation is that the town consider retaining a peer review consultant uh, to review traffic and parking, get a second set of eyes on it, uh, and it's a very common practice. And that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, people, if, if you are not speaking, you might want to mute yourself. And Dick, if you want to stop sharing the screen, unless people want to look at it. Well, I have a question for, for okay. um, the engineer. Uh, you say a blanket number of 16 spaces was used. Um, direct me where that was used by them. Where did you see that? Okay, uh, in the uh, parking memorandum, uh, which I don't have right in front of me, uh, about four different methods were used. And uh, ah, thank you. 
Uh, and um, if you look at um, method one, uh, they use 32 parking spaces for both marijuana retailers combined. And I think if we, um, if we, it's either, it's either up above or somewhere in here, the bottom line was uh, that uh, if you, this is gonna be a, a tech, technical detailed answer. If you look at the data in the parking generation manual and uh, average uh, the peak parking demand at all the sites they looked at, uh, the average number is 16. Uh, now, it was just assumed that that would be the number uh, that uh, the applicant used. Normally, if you do a parking analysis, a bigger facility calls for uh, less parking, more parking, excuse me, in a smaller facility uh, calls for less parking. Uh, and sometimes I've actually seen um, an operational analysis where customer anticipated customer counts figures in and anticipated number of employees. Uh, but but a blanket number is 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 not the typical approach. All right. So I see the 16. I see where they used the 16. Uh, so what number are you saying should be used there? Uh, my uh, my go to number would be to look at the uh, parking generation manual, and I don't have that number at my fingertips. Uh, but um, I seem to remember that number was high. I know that number was higher than 32 if you uh, add those two marijuana facilities. Well, 16 plus 16 is 32. So how much higher than 32 was it? Um, I'm going by memory here. I think the number was uh, uh, up in the 50s for the two marijuana facilities combined. Roger, I, I think this, this question of what parking rate to use was addressed previously by by the applicant and gave a reasonable explanation of why the ITE rate for marijuana establishments was not used in this case. Yeah, uh, and actually, we've got two different we've got two different engineers arguing about what numbers to to use. Uh, it's, it's what it's coming down to. Fred, I'm, I'm actually happy to respond to that. I think it is helpful. I, I've just pulled up the page on marijuana dispensaries from the parking generation manual. And actually I can share that. And I think it'll be clear. I mean, it was mentioned in the text very briefly, but I, I think it'll be clear why I made that decision here. Uh, I didn't do it lightly. Um, and, and it was uh, based on the, the data that's available in the manual. Um, I have question? made you a co-host, Chris. You can share it. All right. Um, I I think if Dick is sharing now, he'll have to stop though. Oh, okay. Um, okay, let me take him out. Oh, maybe I, maybe I could have kicked him out, but that would have been rude. Okay. Did you take me out? I uh, will take you out. I think out, I might be okay. able to. Okay. Okay, okay great. Um, so this is the digital edition of IT Parking 5th Edition um, and Land Use Code Marijuana Dispensary 882. And so the, the key here was that we, we went to this page first um, and what becomes readily apparent is that, uh, first of all, there's only four data points, which makes this a small sample. So that means to be used with caution. And what I noted right off the bat was, uh, so to orient you on this chart, um, the square footage of each uh, store that was analyzed runs along the bottom, uh, increasing left to right, and the number of parked vehicles um, uh, observed um, during the study runs along the left. And what this plot is showing me is that the two largest dispensaries in this study had the two lowest parking rates. Um, so to me, that said that, so, so, <laughs> I guess to to just look at a at a more typical example. Um, oh, I picked a bad one there. Um, let me just show you what what a more robust data set might look like, um, where where we'd have multiple data points and we'd see a clear correlation between the size of the facility. Obviously, not on a straight line because we're dealing with data in the real world and different sites that have different patterns but a clear correlation between size and the number of vehicles parked. And in that case, 
uh, you know, we, we do these for a lot of projects and we take the, the typical, the average uh, parking generation rate and just apply that. Um, in this case, again, I'll bring this sheet back up um, and if I can find it in this list, uh, just between the small sample size and the fact that we found that, that the data that are there um, showed no correlation between size and parking demand. Um, we, I, I went straight with the data as one of multiple ways of trying to assess this uh, project um, and did use um, the average observation. Um, and then, you know, we also, um, I'm going to check back here, um, you know, what I didn't do and include in this memo because it seemed a, a little shooting from the hip was sort of market estimates as to um, demand uh, for parking uh, based on number of customers. That was something that I considered um, as Mr. Hasverian said would be a good idea. Um, it seemed as if we, the applicant would be picking a number out of the sky as to what our market projections were for this site. But uh, what uh, DMCTC has, uh, has sort of in their mind is something around 110 customers a day, which is consistent with the traffic analysis, which we then uh, turned into this parking analysis. And I'll also note that in the special permit hearing for Toro Verde, um, you know, they came up with their own market analysis of how many uh, customers might be generated here. And it was around that same number um, when, when we were working through that process. So, um, you know, as, as, as uh, Mr. Hasverian, I am probably butchering your name and I apologize for that, oh, has noted as I, good. <laughs> oh good, <laughs> as I noted in my analysis, new industry, not a lot of data out there. Um, so what we tried to do was take, make our best effort at uh, analyzing the information that we do have um, and applying it, you know, and then I'll also note that uh, something that came up from the planning board was an, a, an anecdotal assessment of um, driving around to seeing uh, many of the dispensaries open in the Pioneer Valley. And uh, you know, chair, the chair of the planning board, Don Sluter, said that he rarely sees more than about 10 or 12 cars uh, in a lot of these dispensaries. That's not appropriate for an, uh, for an engineering analysis, but it's on the public record, so I thought I'd bring it in. Chris, let me ask you this. Your firm represented Tor Verde when they appeared before us for their special permit, am I correct? Correct. So what numbers did you present to us at that time? Um, I On don't this? believe we got into a detailed discussion, discussion of parking. Um, in fact, looking back at the special permit application, I believe we, we reported that there were 85 to 90 spaces and that this was more than enough for, for what was available. Um, the traffic numbers, I know we did do um, a, a little bit more of an analysis on that. Um, and actually the traffic numbers that were presented for Toro Verde were a little bit lower than what were presented for DMCTC. Um, that's because we, use, we used an older version of the IT manual a few years ago and it didn't have an entry for marijuana. Um, and we didn't have much experience. Um, so I believe that I used a specialty retailer as the closest use possible um, and came up with a similar level of traffic um, that also was consistent with what was projected to be the, the customer traffic counts at the time. Okay, but you used the same 150 square uh, feet of space requires one parking space. Is that, is that correct? Um, yeah, I will be honest. I believe that at that time, we again looked at what the facility actually would need as opposed to what the strict zoning requirements were and sort of the the genesis of that is that this is a commercial property that was developed quite a long time ago. Um, obviously it was approved originally with less parking than would be required um, and, and has functioned through you know, many different tenants, including retail tenants and medical office tenants um, uh, sufficiently. 
Um, and so the proposal was that we have an existing site um, that, that we have from a practical standpoint, <sighs> enough parking spaces um, and, and that that, uh, in our opinion, was sufficient. And, and I still do believe that the site has sufficient parking for Toro Verde. So this kind of gets to the core question for me, which is, do we look at the current permitted use plus the proposed use and see if there are enough spaces or do we consider these future uses? The, um, the brief history that um, I looked at in the last, uh, I guess it was last month since we were last together, was that I looked at the registry deeds to see if we had, that's the easiest way for me to see if we had issued a special permit for um, Mr. Floyd Andrews, who was the developer of the Sugarloaf shops. And um, the answer was no. And then concurrently with that, Dick Evans asked the, um, town clerk and, and Mary do a record search of the ZBA records. So there's, there's no evidence that the ZBA ever was asked to or, or did approve on a special permit basis, the Sugarloaf shops. So I would simply conclude that they got a building permit and they constructed what we see there today with the number of spaces that are there today, um, which simply means we, I think, we, we deal with what we have. 87 or 88 spots there for the two, uh, or one permanent use, one proposed use. Under the math in uh, <clears throat> Attorney Fleischer's memo, the two establishments would require an aggregate of 54 spaces. That's under the zoning, um, leaving a surplus of 33 spaces. That to me is, is fairly convincing um, because I am not inclined to think about the future uses. Whether that leaves somebody out in the future is um, a question I don't think we have to decide now. Conversely, I did hear the, uh, uh, I'll take a shot too, <laughs> has a variety in uh, speech and, and he suggests that we, we hire another engineer for peer review. Um, I mean, that has a certain ring to it also when we have competing engineers, but I'm not, I'm not so sure that's necessary. But these are just my views and I'm, I'm very, very much wide open to everybody else's input. So, Roger, I thought in our last meeting, the owner of the, the co-op, which controls the site and parking, did we, ask him if there's ever been a problem with parking at this site for, for uses that were in existence since, he, since the buildings were open. Have we ever asked, has there been a problem with parking ever? Does anybody remember, was that even, uh, was that asked of him? I don't believe so. Fred, if it was asked, but I don't remember hearing that there'd been a problem, but again, I don't know if it was asked. Bill, Bill Swayze from uh, from Yankee Candle might also know if he's available. Yeah, I'm just was waiting for public comment. I don't know if I can talk now or yet. Go ahead. Um, so, I mean, I, I've got I'm concerned about, you know, the current use and the proposed use of, you know, building a or the red building and limiting how, you know, Yankee Candle can use or market our property. It is a shared parking lot. And I don't see how they can use more than, you know, 50% of the parking lot and monopolize it when it is a shared parking lot. We've never had an issue with parking. My office was over there for four plus years, right next door to uh, Bay State Medical who ran a very vibrant pediatric um, doctor's office there and general medicine, adult medicine. And, you know, we've never, you know, had overflow parking where it had to go down to the red building, nor did they ever have overflow parking that needed to come up our way. So uh, I don't see, you know, it being, you know, that big of an issue, you know, with, with ever maxing out the parking. 
And like I said, I'm just, I'm concerned, you know, about, you know, them, you know, with their, you know, current use and then their, you know, proposed use of a, of a restaurant using, you know, the majority of the parking lot when it's a, it's a condo association, it's a shared parking lot. And, you know, if they own 51% of, you know, the area, they should be allowed to utilize only 51% of the parking, nothing more. Well, Mr. Swayze, I want to make sure which side of the fence you're on. So you represent Yankee Candle. I understand Yankee Candle is the proposed landlord of debilitating. Am I correct? Uh, the building is currently for sale. Okay. But right, yeah. right now, have you got any legal arrangement with debilitating? Any, anything in writing? that? Uh, uh, I, I don't know that answer because I am just the facilities guy. I'm not the real estate that goes through our corporate office out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Well, can someone from the petitioner answer that question? Y yes, we have a signed purchase and sale agreement and Isaac Fleischer, the attorney, can, can talk to any questions about that. <laughs> I just want to know that it exists. Yeah. It very much exists, yes. Okay. Signed by both sides? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, well, so then I don't see how Yankee Candle can be... Uh, concerned with you know you let the cat out of the bag by letting this tenant come in and apply for a special permit um so maybe i'll ask a pointy question are, are you opposing this permit sir on behalf of yankee candle no i'm in favor of it i mean okay i mean so you're concerned yeah, you say concerned you're concerned with Toro verde trying to do something Correct. I mean, if they added a restaurant and they monopolized the rest of the parking, you know, that would limit, you know, the use of, of our building significantly. All right. Well, that's that's the place we don't really want to go to because that's not on the table. Yep. Um, Understood and 100 percent in agreement. OK, Roger, Roger yeah. I uh, just going back to a comment that you made before. Uh, I'm not interested in thinking about what possible uses on this property could eventually someday possibly exist. What we have is an applicant who has a proposal and we need to deal with that. And and I just, I don't wanna hear any more about a restaurant. Okay. I agree, I agree completely. Okay. And, and I, I think we we asked the last, the last meeting about adding more parking spaces on the on the site itself, and I guess the answer was uh, there's no way to get more spaces. But thinking about the the, the map and, and the area, isn't there vacant land across the road from Old State Road? That I, I mean, the future use could could be for parking, or even on the north side. There, I know there's a building on the north side that's I don't know if it's occupied or not. It could be even purchased for future parking if, if parking becomes an issue. Well, I'm not sure we want to go there either. No, but but I mean, it, it, is parking just conf confined to this site only and that's it? I, I, I think there's possibilities to expand. <gasps> not, not on the site, but additional, buying additional properties if, if this is a, but I, I don't think we can consider what no. what they might do in terms no. of purchasing more land. I, I I I think I think we've made that clear. We have to look at what we have before us. Yeah, I, I agree too. We we want to look at what's before us. You know, to to validate Fred's point from a business perspective, if they have a problem down the road, that there could be other solutions. So, but again, that's not something we need to help solve. Um, um, we do have a, Dick has his hand up to speak. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to add uh, that the code is very clear that when calculating the space required, you are to consider the entire property. In this case, the entire property means the entire building. You can't simply ignore the, the space that, that um, debilitating does not intend to occupy in that building. You've got to consider the entire building. And let me just say one other thing, and that is that um, 
if, if, if debilitating is asking the board, it sounds like they are, to depart from the requirements of the uh, code, uh, then they should be asking for a variance as well as special permit. And, and, uh, but, but because their, their, their application does not strictly meet the criteria that's set forth in the zoning code, it would be beyond the authority of the board to, uh, to grant this application. Well, I've looked at that language and um, you know, Isaac put it in italics in his memo and it comes from our 171-28.6D2. I, I find it rather vague, to tell you the truth. I mean, yeah, I know they haven't applied for a variance. I, I don't think they, I don't think they're asking for a variance. I know they're not, they're not asking for a variance. No. The applicant for a special permit for such use shall demonstrate that the entire property, what does demonstrate mean? They demonstrate that the entire property shall comply with these requirements and controls following the established establishment of such use thereon. Um, I don't know, someone drafted that. <laughs> that just sounded good on the drafting board, but I don't know how you apply it in, in real life. Um, Roger, could you please give me the, Cite, cite me the number of what you just read. Yes, I can. It's it's um, it's in the marijuana subsection of the of the bylaws. It's one seventy one dash twenty eight point six D capital D two. Thank you. Go ahead, Dick. Oh, I was going to say if if you consider that the only building or thirty one hundred. It, uh, square feet represents the entire property. Or if you consider that all 8,000 square feet consider, consist of the entire property, you still come out with the same result. I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if you assume that the entire property is the entire building, you know, the entire, and it is, you can't assume otherwise, I'm sorry. The, the entire property is not 3,100 square feet, it's 8,000 square feet, period. I don't think that's vague. And it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. What would happen if you allowed a special permit for the 3,100 square feet, and then someone came along later and wanted to put uh, a restaurant or an office or whatever in some of the remaining space? Would you say, sorry, can't, you can't be done. The building must remain vacant. What about Isaac's point that it's worth noting under the Tour of Verde's analysis, Tour of Verde itself would have been prohibited from obtaining a special permit. Oh, so I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that at all. I, I'm not sure what, why would, what would forbid them from getting a special permit three years ago. Isaac has his hand up, Roger. Isaac, go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so what, what would prohibit uh, Tour of Verde from getting a special permit under Dick's proposed interpretation uh, would be that uh, no matter what was what use there was at the time, Dick is suggesting that Toro Verde could only obtain a special permit if uh, there was enough parking uh, for every square foot of all three condos to be occupied. And as we've discussed, at 150 square feet, uh, at one space per, per 150 square feet, if every square foot of all three condos is occupied with retail, then, then there's, there's insufficient parking. Um, but the way that the, the relevant uh, ordinance reads, what you just cited, Roger, um, it, it's, it is a little ambiguous, but it says, um, uh, demonstrate the entire property shall comply with these requirements. Um, and I think that the, the difference in interpretation is that Dick is suggesting not just entire property, but entire property uh, uh, into the future. Um, there's no way for the ZBA to analyze parking use of hypothetical uses. Uh, and neither would it make sense for the ZBA to prevent certain uses now in order to preserve hypothetical uses in the future. Um, the entire property right now uh, requires no parking because 
there, there are no uses on the property. We certainly should account for permitted uses. So we're taking into account Torre Verde and we're taking into account the uh, DMC's application for a special permit, but there's no way uh, that this could possibly be interpreted to require the ZBA to calculate hypothetical uses into the future. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I agree. The board should not be asked to, to calculate hypothetical uses in the future. I think the board should, however, apply the zoning code as written. And it's very clear. You've got to consider the entire property. There's no ambiguity there. And, and about that, you are referring to the 150 square feet equals one parking space. No, I'm referring to the provision that Roger was talking about, uh, Article 5, Section 171-26.8.6 D2, which says the applicant shall demonstrate that the entire property shall comply with these requirements. And these requirements include the one space per 150 square foot of, of gross floor area. Right, and, and that's how we that's how we calculated um, uh, that's how we calculated 52 spaces, uh, I'm sorry, 54 spaces are required using that calculation. 150, uh, one parking space per 150 square feet. Um, and on the property, we are accounting for Toro Verde, which is not yet operating, but is permitted. Um, they permitted for 5,000 square feet. Uh, that would require 33.33 spaces. And then DMC is asking for a permit for 3,100 square feet. That requires 20.67 spaces. You put that together and you've got 54 spaces. So it's absolutely compliant. The only way to say it's not compliant is to interpret it as requiring uh, a, a calculation of every hypothetical use into the future for every square foot. Well, I, I've never mentioned the word hypothetical or future. And I, I just don't understand um, how, how you can justify ignoring the plain language of the zoning code. Well, I, I guess what uses are, are, how do you get above 54 spaces? What other uses are there on the property that need to be accounted for? Well, right now there's, there's a, I'm not sure I understand. There's, we got, Toro Verde is already permitted Mm -hmm. and they they will consume about fifty four spaces, right? No, by the by the zoning ordinance, they require thirty three point three three spaces. No, no, Isaac, they require about fifty four spaces because you got to consider the spaces required for eight thousand square feet of gross floor area. Their their special permit is for a five thousand square foot retail facility. I understand that, but the parking requirement requires consideration of the entire property. It's it's because if you just consider the five thousand. That's to say someone who comes along and wants to occupy the 3,000, they're just out of luck. Are, you, are, you just, are, is the, are we saying the, these, these buildings must remain vacant? So are you interpreting entire property to mean wall-to-wall uh, -wall of each building? Yeah, each condo. There's, there's three condos here. Okay, so, so the... the uh, three units, I'm sorry, one condo. Okay. Right, so uh, section 171.13, which is where this uh, one space per 150 Sorry. square feet comes from. It, it says excluding storage areas. Yeah. So I, I think that's clear that space that's not being used is not accounted for here. So if they're permitted for 5,000 square feet, they need parking for 5,000 square feet. It, it, it doesn't mean that another 3,000 feet of vacant space needs parking. It says one space for each 150 square feet of gross floor area. Excluding storage areas. Well, is the, are you saying that the, the other remaining area is, is being used for storage? Is it? If it's vacant, well, is it? then yes. Well, I don't know what the, 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 the basis of that is. We've never alleged that we're using our additional space for storage. And I don't think, uh, uh, in fact, I recall last time, uh, debilitating said they were looking for additional tenants. I don't even believe that it is Torre Verde's additional space, correct? That 3,000 square feet isn't even being leased by Torre Verde. And what do you do when it goes to the door? 
No, I, I think Toro Verde's leases for the entire building. They're talking about subleasing the three thousand. You can press the button there. Yes, they are. <laughs> yeah, I, I I haven't seen Toro Verde's lease, but but either way, the, the three thousand square feet uh, isn't being used. So to calculate it. Um, to put it into your calculation, oh, you are using a hypothetical use. Uh, it could be storage space. It could be mm -hmm. demolished. We, we don't know. But right now, there's only 5,000 square feet being permitted. Well, the big question here, which we've all avoided, is why does this, this plaza only have, what, 84, 87 spaces when, it, when, it, when zoning requires a lot more than that? And I don't know the answer to that question. And I don't think the board should make a decision on this until it knows the answer to that question. I don't know the answer to that question it. either. And I don't see why it's relevant here um, because we're not, there's no special permit being considered for um, the entire, for all three buildings. There's a special permit being considered for uh, 3,100 square feet. And there has already been a special permit issued for 5,000 square feet. There's no reason no, to, no. to account for anything else. No, no, the permit was, was for our 8,000 square feet. Do we have an answer to that? Mary, you I, have a copy of the permit anywhere? Or no, we- Let me- uh, Look for a copy of a permit. You asked me to check on it for Mr. Andrus or Andrews or whatever the- that, We don't have a way back permit. But we certainly there was a permit issued to Toro Verde. Do you have a copy of it? I do. You want to put it up? Yes. Can you? Uh... <laughs> Can you see it? Um, no, I need to make you a co-host again. Okay. To be on. I believe your co-host. Okay, can you see it? Not yet, you need okay. to go to share screen. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. That's okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> there. No, I think you've got it. Okay, now it's coming. Okay, okay. Okay. So here's the uh, special permit. Let's see. Okay, I'm looking for the square footage. We can try to find it. Well, maybe it's in. Uh... Let me look in the uh, application. That's what it would be. Yeah. I, I can tell you for sure what the application says is it's a 5,000 square foot marijuana establishment because that's the maximum allowed under the zoning code. Um, and that uh, Torre Verde intended to sublease to, I believe it said a general retail uh, tenant, the remaining 3,000 square feet. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Five thousand right there. There is a zoning law that says the zoning bylaw. Yeah, to an entirety of building A, which includes eight thousand square feet. So it simply says that they hold the lease to it. Oh, yeah. Right, and then and then in the next sentence, the remaining space is proposed to remain unoccupied initially. However, the applicant may choose to sublease this space to a general retail tenant. And they may well choose to sublease, but at that point, we would have to look at the whole parking situation again, based on who's in the in the condo facility. All right. So because the bylaw only allows 5,000 square feet, I think that's pretty clear that the permitted use is for 5,000 square feet. So here's how I'm looking at this, um, the italicized language again, the 171, uh, 28 D2. And I'm reading it again from 
maybe this is the fourth time this evening. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll go slowly. I guess it's too bad I, I can't put it up on the screen, but. I have it, Roger. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um... Okay, am, am I still sharing the screen? You are no. if you want to, but you're not sharing it now. Oh, okay. Thank you. You have permission to. Thank you. Okay, here is the, uh, here's that, that section, and here's the language you're talking about right here. There it is, two, number two. All right, so it's the second sentence. For any property, and I'll stop right there with the word property. As I'm reading it again for the fourth time, I think that property there means the 5,000 square foot permitted property. So for any property proposed to contain a marijuana establishment business in commercial industrial or industrial districts, the applicant for a special permit for such use shall demonstrate that, and here it's bold, that the entire property, and that's where I think it's ambiguous, that the entire property should comply with these requirements. I'm not sure what the entire property means because does it mean the entire permitted property? Well, maybe not, because why do they say the entire, whereas before they didn't say the entire. But does it mean every square foot built in that condominium? Um, that's, that's what the board has to decide. Um, is, uh, is this something we should get clarification on from town council? I mean, I see what you're saying, Roger, and it's bolded. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think that bold comes from. Oh yeah, I think I, I, well, I know I know the bolding has been done elsewhere. Yeah, that's fine. But, but it, Mr. It, Dick it, Evans, yes. <laughs> yes, no, I understand that that's not in our. I'm saying it's bolded and it, it's bolded in my mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know this. I know it's in the bylaw that way. Uh, yeah, well, maybe we should get a legal opinion, a town council opinion about that, because I'm. Uh, it is I, ambiguous I, to me. I am winging it a little bit here, and it is ambiguous. Um, I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea because I think this all hinges on this particular paragraph. Because if it's not every square foot, I think there. I think that the applicant is in, and that we can justifiably grant the permit. On the other hand, I guess the opposite result uh, would would um, apply if if it's a larger section of property. I, I actually, I, I'm not so sure about that. I, so I'd like, if we do go to town council with it, I'd like to clarify what we're asking. Because if you were to interpret it, entire property as uh, the entire condominium, all three buildings, mm -hmm. um, I still don't think we have the result that uh, attorney Evans is suggesting because the the remainder of the condominium is currently vacant and, and i i think that uh that's relevant um entire i think entire property would be a much more important distinction if this were a fully occupied condominium um i would agree to be honest with dick evans that if it were fully occupied that we would that that uh, DMC could not simply calculate its own uh, parking needs, but it would need to calculate its parking needs um, within the context of the parking needs of of all other existing uses. Um, but the fact that it's not occupied means there's no way to calculate uh, to calculate parking beyond the two permitted uses. Um, without making some sort of guess about future uses. And I, I do think it's relevant that the, the parking calculation that we keep referencing, 150 square feet, uh, one space per 150 square feet, uh, I really think it's important to finish that sentence 
Uh, it says excluding storage areas uh, because that that suggests that um, it's not simply a calculation of wall to wall measurement, but rather how uh, how that floor space is used. And I know it is uh, it might be it might seem unlikely to uh, assume that the entire rest of the condominium is storage area, but it is vacant. And to, to calculate it for anything requires uh, some sort of a, a prediction of future uses. Uh, I just don't see how that's, that could ever be what a zoning ordinance calls for. And I guess I would also add that there are a number of uses under the zoning code that require, and I can we can look at the language if need to need be, but the there are certain uses where the parking requirement is not defined, and it is up to the 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 board. I don't know if it's the planning board or ZBA to determine what is reasonable based on uh, the application. All right. Well, how about this? <clears throat> We've got three attorneys here. Why don't we three attorneys? I think try to come up with a, a, a question or a series of questions, almost like an agreed upon statement of facts that we submit to the town council. See if we can come up with that. And then uh, when we go to the town council, it's usually um, uh, get a response within a month or, or, or within the month. So it'll cause another delay, but I don't think it's be an unnecessarily long delay. Does that make sense? I'm willing to participate in that, sure. If, if the ZBA feels that it's necessary, of course, I'm willing to participate in it. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I, I think, well, let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. Let's, um, let's take a vote and, and see if the ZBA agrees that we should submit a question or he was a question to the town council. So I would be in favor of that. I would too. I would be in favor of it as well. All right. So now that we have crossed that threshold, uh, is it fair to say both council uh, agreed to uh, coming up with a question or, or series of questions? Yes, absolutely. Certainly. Okay. Then that's, that's what we'll do. And, um, I'm around tomorrow and, and next week. So we have each other. We can, can come up with something. Um, I guess I'll, I'll take the first stab at it, but it'll be it'll be a rough stab, and I recognize that it'll be edited by the others. So, okay. Anything else we want to talk about? <laughs> no, we'll, we'll be okay. so, oh, thanks very much. Okay. I don't we could. When are we continuing to? Yeah, Mary, what's the, what is it, October? Uh, October we don't, we don't, I haven't received anything for October. All right, so we can be the first one out in the uh, first Thursday of October, which is October 7th. October 7th, 6.40 p.m. We'll see you then. Are, are, have we narrowed it down to just the question of whether or not the zoning ordinance uh, allows this use? Or are we still, uh, because we started out talking about things like traffic, um, uh, we, have, we have competing uh, uh, engineers reports. Uh, are those all going to be questions to address again at the next meeting or, or are we now really just addressing the question of the zoning ordinance? Well, we haven't voted on anything else to questions or not, but I, I think we are, as a board, are capable of handling all the other questions. So it'll still be an open meeting. Anyone can participate, but we'll our goal will be to narrow the um, discussion and, and, and then factor in what town council has to say and then reach a vote that night. What? <laughs> people who are not participating should mute. We have 47 people in this meeting. <laughs> That answer your question, Isaac? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, great. See you in October. See you in October. Yeah, I'm down here. Number four. Eight. Eight.
overview of greenhouse assessment and speak to the current state. Some of the other things before they get to you. So I don't worry if they can't hear Mary, we've got a new one coming on, and then whenever you're ready, you can read the legal notice. Unless anyone wants to have a break at this point. I'm okay. You're okay. I'm okay. All right. Deborah, apparently your request has gone uh, unnoticed by many people. Well, I find me... it extremely um, distracting uh, to listen to people's whispered conversations during yes. this meeting. Let and me say again that if you are not participating, please mute yourself and unmute yourself when you do want to participate because we are hearing people whisper saying, no, they can't hear me, but we can. <laughs> so it's, it is time to mute unless you're speaking, except for we members of the board. I know that, Chris, thank you. <laughs> so Mary, whenever you're ready. Oh, okay, just a moment, please. <clears throat> Legal Notice, Zoning Board of Appeals, Town of Waitley. Notice is hereby given that the Zoning Board of Appeals of Waitley will hold a public hearing on Thursday, September 2nd, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. On July 27th, 2021, Jerry Mason applied for a special permit to add an accessory apartment per Waitley Bylaws Section 171-8 Table of Use Regulations on premises located at 149 Haydenville Road and owned by Julia Mason. Application for the special permit is to be considered under the provisions of the Waitley Zoning Bylaws as provided by Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A. The hearing will take place virtually via Zoom. The rules of decorum for a public hearing remain in effect and the chairperson will seek comments from the public when appropriate to do so. There follows the access hearing uh, and codes uh, material numbers. Uh, and it ends, this notice is published electronically on uh, www.recorder.com slash public dash notices and www.massapublicnotices.org. Signed Roger P. Lippin Chair, Zoning Board of Appeals, and this notice ran in the Greenfield Recorder on August 19th and 26th. Who's here for the applicant? I am, it's Julie. Hi. Hi, Julie, how are you? Good Do you have you. any objections to the way that was phrased and published? Nope, I don't. Jerry's here as well, by the way. Okay. All right, so why don't you tell us what you wanna do and why you think we should grant the permit? We just want to um, put a small apartment into the house, um, just add a little extra space for, for a small apartment. I'm actually going to be moving back to the area, so I wanted to do that because I have somebody renting it as well right now. You can see that last part, you have someone what again? Uh, there's someone that's renting on one side, on, on the main, in the house. And uh, so we wanted to put a small apartment into uh, the area by the barn. And who's going to live there? I am. How large is it going to be? I think it's at uh, like 700. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, it's within the requirements of the accessory apartment square footage. It's approximately 800 square feet. I, I didn't hear how much. How many I said it's approximately 800 square feet. I believe the zoning allows for 826. Have you got plans already drawn up? Yes, I, I did forward them to the Zoning Board of Appeals. 
And so on the plans, is, is it show the exact number? Yes. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Um, let me, I'm going to duck out and see if I can get these plans. Um, I'm going to attempt to share that. Is this your, the plan you're speaking of? Correct. Okay. Um, this is, I'm afraid this is the way it is. So we're looking at it sideways. Um, That's the first floor, yeah. Yeah, okay. And we have a second floor. And this is this is the plan. Is there a square footage here? Yes, there is on the, the pre previous page. It says 800. <clears throat> this is the plan. Hmm. Okay, um, I think if you what, go down, maybe one more. No, is it, is it not? No, go back up. This is what we have. This is what was submitted. Yeah, the first page of the plan, the actual drawing. Okay. I don't, yeah, okay, I, I don't, maybe I don't see it there. No, I'm, I'm not seeing it. The bottom, uh, which would be on the left. It just has one, it four, just gives four, the measurement. Four rooms. Okay. Eight, it's yeah, four here. rooms, 800 square feet. Eight, four, yeah, right down here. And anyone can find this. I just went to our town website and it has been loaded up there under ZBA. So this is what I'm pulling up. All right, so our bylaw, which governs accessory apartments, uh, interestingly is in the um, definition section on page 102. It says the owner of the property shall permanently occupy the principal or accessory residence. So uh, Julie, your intent is to occupy there permanently? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it says no more than two people shall occupy the accessory apartment. So yeah, if anybody comes with me, it'll be my um, my daughter who's going to be. She's actually getting ready to launch out herself. But our, yes, our daughter. <laughs> our daughter. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I stand corrected that she's going to be living with me there. Okay. <laughs> Jerry, you're not living there now, right? No, Roger. Okay. Okay. Um, questions from neighbors and abutters? I have a question. Um, Nancy Wilson, I live next door at 155 Haydenville Road. And um, a neighbor across the street, Bill Harlow, stopped by late last week he was not able to be here tonight, but he did tell me that he had dropped off a letter that was written that he would like entered on the record. He delivered it to Lynn Simply, so I don't know if you have received that letter. I do have that letter. Were you planning on reading it, Roger? I was hoping that he was gonna be present. Uh, and sometimes people think they can't participate because of the Zoom technology, but. Yeah, apparently, um, and I don't know where in New Hampshire, but he was going to be up 
in New Hampshire somewhere. He didn't feel that he would be able to participate. Uh, however, he did give me a copy of the letter and asked me if I would read it, if it was not going to be entered into the record and if it was not going to be read by you. Well, so let's do it this way. But I, I will say just for the general public, we're always available by phone as well as Zoom. But I would definitely, yes, enter it into the record. And um, I actually do feel better with someone else reading it because I don't want it to seem like it's coming from me necessarily because I'm a neutral person and neutral decision maker. So I'd be happy to have you read it, Nancy. Okay. Um, so this is dated August 31st, 2021. Written by Bill Harlow, 140 Haydenville, Haydenville Road, West Waitley, Mass, 01039. He's also included his phone number. It reads, regarding Gerald and Julia Mason's application for special permit to add an accessory apartment per 171-8 table of use regulations. Dear Zoning Board members, I am unable to attend tonight's meeting via Zoom or phone, so I would like this letter entered into the record regarding the above mentioned application. My concern is the following. It is my belief that for the application to be considered, the house at 149 Haydenville Road has to be owner occupied. I live slightly above 149 Haydenville Road and on the opposite side of the road. I travel past 149 Haydenville Road almost on a daily basis. And I can say with certainty that Julia Mason, parentheses owner, does not live there. I cannot be sure how long it has been, but a guess of six to seven years plus would probably be accurate. Even on the application for special permit, Julia Mason's current address is listed as 11 Mountain Road in Holland, Mass. It is my understanding that Julia Mason is the sole owner of 149 Haydenville Road. Also on the drawings that were included with the application, there is a first floor and a second floor sketch. Based on my calculations, the first floor is roughly 788 square feet and the second floor comes in around 273 square feet for a total of 1,061 square feet. It is my understanding that 800 square feet is the limit on existing dwelling conversions. The house is currently rented out to, I think, two people. It has been for at least a year. Prior to that, it has remained empty and unmaintained for quite a few years. It became a real neighborhood eyesore. Finally, it is my belief that this application request for a special permit at an accessory apartment is just an attempt to convert a single family dwelling into a two family dwelling and then put it up for sale as such or continue renting, but now with two apartments. This use is certainly not in the spirit of the 171-8 table of use regulations. Please do not allow this special permit application to move forward. Respectfully submitted, William Harlow. End of letter. All right, thank you. You certainly read that very accurately. Um, now you're here, Nancy, do you have any um, opinion about this application? I do. Um, I, I have been disappointed in the upkeep of the home. Um, you know, Waitley is a, a really lovely area, and I think a lot of people want to live in our community. And most of our community members work really hard on their properties because, of course, surrounding properties affects affect all of the value of our homes. So. I remember it back when the Stefanics had it, when Ed lived there. And it would, it would be nice to see it return to some balance um, that would fit nicely into the neighborhood. The lawn is unmowed met much of the time. The field has overgrown. Uh, the hillside has filled in with trees and, and brush. 
we do a, a small bed and breakfast within our home. So of course the neighborhood surroundings is important to us. For a period of time, the house, I believe was unoccupied. And I also thought that it was going to be taken by the bank, but I am not sure of that. So my concern is strictly for the neighborhood. And I, if it were maintained, I'm not sure if I would have an objection, but I am concerned also about whether this would be a two family, if it was going to hit the market, um, all of those things. So I, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat negative on it only because of the reasons that I've stated. Do you think that if what we're hearing is, is accurate that uh, Mrs. Mason intends to move back in and presumably they're going to do some fixing up to get that second part in there. You think that would improve the appearance of it or do you have no idea? Well, I think that they would have to remove some of the unregistered vehicles that are in the lot. I, I, I know much of them, are, well, I don't know. They, there are not as many visible as there once were. So I think that um, they have been removing some of the vehicles. But I know that from our bedroom window, which faces the west, there has been a time where you could see a lot of debris in the backyard, in the side yard. Because the grass has gotten so long and the vegetation, it's somewhat concealing what is there now. Um, but I, I would think that there would be substantial cleanup to do. And I, I would also wonder about the sewer system, the existing mm -hmm. sewer system. Those are my concerns. Okay, great, thanks. Well, what do you speak about that? Would that be okay to speak? Well, let's, yeah, so let's first address the square footage raised in Mr. Harlow's letter. It's a total of 800 square feet that's allowed, not 100, that 800 on one floor and, and then a certain amount on another floor. So is the, to, uh, is the total square footage 800? Or is it more than that? 800. Well, what about his calculations of 243 on the second? I, I don't know how he calculated that. Mr. Harlow's never been in my home. I'd also like to say for the record, uh, Mr. Harlow's tried to buy property from me at well below value. I didn't agree to a sale. And he's, he has been very upset with me for years. As far as the brush on the hill, I cleared that off when we first bought the property and I decided to let it grow back because that's how it was. The field, uh, the grass grows long because we have it, uh, it's hayed. So they allow it to grow long to hay the field. Oh, I understand that. The entire field is not hayed. There's a portion of the field that for one reason or another is not hailed, hayed. And I think it was because the brush got so long, but it, it doesn't answer the question to the concern that we have as your neighbors um, looking out and seeing what we see. I understand. Nancy, Absolutely, I Nancy. Think... I agree. If, you know, yeah. if for one, one, one time, I mean, if you just sent a letter or walked over, I mean, we'd be happy to, uh, the no, two cars I, I have, I have, okay. two reg I have two unregistered cars. Mm -hmm. There are cars, they run. So they're not junk cars. Um, I'll be happy to move them. I can put them into a barn. I can do, I can do, you know, I can, you know, that's not a problem. What about that bulldozer? <laughs> oh, that old dozer, that yeah, old uh, Oliver. I see that's it when my... I flag, because I, I like to look at your place. I see that. Yeah, old... that's my father's, uh, you know. It's you know, runs. I agree with you actually about a lot of it. And that's one of the conversations that Jerry and I had. Um, as you know, we split up, and so I haven't been in the area for quite some time. Um, and we had kind of a messy situation, and we kind of had that the situation that people go through when they when their marriage ends. And you know, I agree that things got out of um, not not in the best of um, kept ways. And so, if I'm going to be moving back there, um, I don't want to live in a place that you know is um, in disarray. So, my plan is to um, see that that will uh, be dealt with. Um, I'm going to be working at school again, um, is kind of a part-time thing. And I, you know, my hope is to, you know, get things straightened back up 
and uh, to live in a place that I feel good about. And, you mm -hmm. know, and I enjoyed living with you, you know, next to you guys as far as our neighbors. So I'm hoping that, you know, all of this we can work through and um, come to a good solution. Yeah, I'm not adverse to that, but you have to admit historically, the property has not been well maintained. That's all I I'm saying. I understand completely. Historically, historically, would we? How is it going to change with an accessory apartment? You would have additional oh. people there. So, I mean, how? It's just going to be me actually, you know, working to try to get things back in shape again. And I'm hoping that Jerry can help me for sure. Um, he doesn't live in the area. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see to it, though, that we can um, plan for it to be kept back up again. And, uh, you know, the, the lawn <coughs> load and, um, you know, not so many weeds and the issue with the, the vehicles to be dealt with. And I'm glad that you said this so that way we can manage it. Roger? Yes, but um, Should we ask for more than a hand-drawn plan? Mm -hmm. um, because recently, and, and tonight is no exception, we have discovered that people tell us things, they tell us about ownership, they tell us about all kinds of things, their plans, and then suddenly those all change. And that someone draws something and tells us it's 800 square feet does not necessarily, and I'm not making any accusation, I'm simply saying that as a policy, I think we need something more than hand-drawn plans. I just, I needed to say that. I, I think that's a, a legitimate request. And I think the building inspector would want something more than that too to issue a building permit. It's not required. I have a CSL license. Uh, Hand-drawn hand plans are fine. I was a draftsman for about 20 years uh, and a design engineer. So I, I can actually give you a full set of plans if you, if you like on a D-sized piece of paper, that's not a problem. Well, I certainly think and I can I can also vouch that the apartment will not be over 800 square feet. It can be adjusted, and, and that's 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 the promise I make. Well, look, and I will say I know I know the Wilsons, I know the Masons for many years, and I, I like everybody. Um, but since there's a, an objection raised by Mr. Harlow, and he's raising the square footage objection. And since you've offered, uh, why not let's take Bob up on his uh, request slash suggestion and ask for some more uh, plans from you, Jerry, just that are more more precise, okay? Sure. That, that gives us a better comfort level in relying upon them. Absolutely. So, all right, so that, that would be one thing. And then um, I understand about the two unregistered vehicles that are still workable, but... Um, That's not a problem, Roger. Like I said, if we'd known about there was a, an issue or a, you know a, a, an uneasiness or unhappiness, you know I could have handled it years ago. Well, I was frankly glad to see the number decrease to two. From I think at one time it might have been five or six. So it has improved bringing it to two. Well, I don't know how many there were, but also as far as to, to address a historic, well, historically speaking, on the the condition of the property when we got there. We had renovated the entire farmhouse, the entire inside. Uh, we put roofs on all of the, the buildings. We put we roofed the house. We was, roofed it, the, the I two agree. Please, please, I'm speaking. Thank you. And we roofed the two barns across the street. I did extensive repair to the rafters across the street and the tobacco barn. And 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 they've been like that for 20 years. They're dry, they're solid, they're in great shape. Roger. I I don't disagree. I, I, you did a nice job. It's just been over the last several years when we, that the property was not being lived in and different people were living there yeah. and it was no longer maintained. Right. Well, as Julie said, that we did have a breakup and, um, you know, we're, uh, these things happen. I mean, it's, it, it was kind of a little bit beyond our control. Um, things are a little more back to normal now. And, uh, you know, we, we as, also I'd like to address the part about thinking that there was never a reason where a bank ever, ever, uh, the payments are always up on, on, on the, the building. 
So no bank was ever going to take it. Um, all, right, so all, right, all these things that we hear, are, none of these, there's no truth to any of this. All right, that, that one factor into our decision anyway. Um, I understand. It just, it just the rumors are, I have, I just like to address them that it, it's, it just, you have to address them at some point. Okay. Bob, what did you want to say, Bob? I just wanted to say, Jerry, that um, according to our zoning bylaws, you're only allowed one unregistered vehicle. Okay, Bob, that's not a problem. I can take care of that. So now, I wonder, I wonder if, if this is a site where we should take a view. I'm happy to take a view. So we often, we'll often pick a Saturday and we'll just come by and look for those who aren't that familiar with the property. Just look around. It's not, it's not necessarily a continuation of the hearing. There's no real tough questions asked or anything like that. It's just for us to eyeball the place. So, um, Bob, you okay with a view? Oh, absolutely. All right. How about this Saturday? Uh, um, yes, if it's early esque, <laughs> like like ten a.m. Do you guys have to get into the property? Because I'm actually I can't be there this weekend. I no. have to be away. It's it's well, most of the time it's exterior. There was one time we looked at an inside of an accessory apartment that was already built. This accessory apartment apartment's not built here, so there's nothing no. inside. So, but you'll show us where the accessory apartment would be, right? Yes. Okay. I, I, I'd have to check. I'm not sure I can actually make it on such short notice for Saturday. Well, what about the Saturday? If we're, we're, we're obviously going to um, continue this, so what about the Saturday after that? That's fine. Uh, actually, I've got a funeral to go to. Um... Well, we could keep going because you know we're gonna we're gonna bump it out a month. So yeah, we've got other Saturdays. <laughs> we've got other Saturdays. We got Saturdays every week. Um, how about September eighteenth? I'm not okay. available. I'm not available, but that doesn't. I mean, Fred and Kristen are both here, so they could vote on the. Okay. Okay, September eighteenth. Uh, I believe I'm free. Yeah. Okay, so, I I could do any time that day. Brad and, and or Kristen, is that good for you? No, that's, a, that's okay for me. Uh, good for me. All right, so let's say September 18th. How about 11? Okay. 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 All right, so that's that. And so then you'll get us updated plans, Jerry, by October 7th, which is our next meeting. And we already scheduled one for 640 that night. So we'll, what do we usually do, Mary? Say 715? Usually, yeah. Roger, yep. is it is it uh, okay for me to drive by the property so that I can just see it from the road? Sure. Okay. We've done that before when people yes. couldn't make a view. Right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, get yourself out to West Whaley, Bob. Yes, That's right. <laughs> I way. have to go that way to get to my son and daughter-in-law. You will in Haydenville, yeah. yeah. And my granddaughter. Was she born? So, was she born? She was born, yes. Sunday. Wow. Thank you. Oh, what is the time, actual time? 11. 11, okay. Roger, this is Keith Bartle. I just wanted to have a minute to ask a question. Go for it. Um, Jerry, is the accessory apartment, is that in part of the main house or were you looking at in the where would have been the barn area yeah it's in the barn area okay that's what i thought that was my only my only question and i i don't have any issues okay thanks uh, keith now when you say the barn area um that's not the barn all, that's not the barn that's across the street is it no no it's all attached yeah okay all right well then we'll see you on 18th Yes. Okay. All right, so this meeting is adjourned. Roger, do you think we could have a break before the next one? Because this could break, go a while. I think a break is well, uh, well deserved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. We'll take a 10 minute break. For the next hearing. A legal notice reads, legal notice, Zoning Board of Appeals, Town of Whateley, 
Notice is hereby given that the Zoning Board of Appeals of Waitley will hold a public hearing on Thursday, September 2nd, 2021 at eight o'clock p.m. The hearing will take place virtually via Zoom. The rules of decorum for a public hearing remain in effect and the chairperson will seek comments from the public when appropriate to do so. On March 4th, 2021, Waitley RE Holdings, LLC, was granted a special permit for indoor marijuana cultivation on property located at 23A LaSalle Road and owned by LaSalle Florists Incorporated. On August 12th, 2021, Waitley RE Holdings LLC applied for a variance to relieve the obligation of the applicant to utilize buildings in existence on April 24th, 2018 as part of this project. The applicant now wishes to demolish existing greenhouses and replace them with modern ones. Application for the variance is to be considered under the provisions of the Whiteley Zoning Bylaws as provided by Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A. This notice is also published electronically on www.recording.com slash public notices and www.masspubliknotices.org. Then follows the uh, access codes and information. And the notice is signed Roger P. Lipton Chair, Zoning Board of Appeals. And this notice ran in the Greenfield Recorder on August 19th and 26th. Okay, who's here for the applicant? Good evening, everybody. Hi, everyone. This is Chris Simony. I'm with uh, Waitley Ari Holdings and Canna Select. And we have a few others on the call as well. Uh, we do have a PowerPoint we'd like to go through, if that's okay, if you could enable screen sharing. Yes, I will. Let me ask my first question. Sure. Do you have any objections to the way the public uh, notice was advertised? I do not. Okay. Okay, so, you are enabled. Okay. Okay, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks everybody for um, allowing us to speak tonight. I wanna to give a quick introduction uh, to those that are on the, on the call tonight that'll be speaking on our behalf. So again, I'm Chris Simony, my father, Robert Simony and I have been involved in the project since the, since the get-go here. Uh, a couple of others on the call tonight, we have Andrea Nusifaro Jr., uh, Devin Grierson, they're both with the Nusifaro Law Group. We have Dave Lazinski from Deerfield Greenhouses. We have Lou and Anthony Allegroni from the Allegroni Companies. So first wanna give a quick, quick project update. As far as town approvals, um, again, this is just an update, but uh, we received our host community agreement uh, from the select board in December of 2020, which allows 100,000 square feet of cultivation on the site. We received our planning board approval for the project in uh, April of 21 and received the zoning board of approval and a special permit to cultivate cannabis on the site in March of 2021. So since receiving our special permit, uh, we engaged some new team members um, as that was a key step in the process. Uh, one, of the, one of the partners is, is Nick Wilson, who's a very successful grower out of Maine. He currently has several uh, cultivation operations and retail, retail establishments in Maine. Uh, we engaged the New Sephora Law Group which is a well-established firm in Western Mass. They have extensive zoning, um, cannabis experience, and, and, and other experience as well. And then the Allegroni Companies, which is a, a three-generation full-service design, engineering, and construction firm. Um, update on the state licensing process. We did receive our provisional license from the Cannabis Control Commission in July of 2021, which allows us um, to move forward in the process to obtain our final license. Um, part of that is applying for each investor to be registered as a cannabis agent representative, which we're currently doing right now. So our, our goal and plan is to be cultivating in the spring of 2022. Um, as far as funding goes, we are final, we finalized our capital commitments. We obtained our first round of funding and we're ready to move this process forward as soon as we can. So we're here tonight to request a variance as stated earlier. And this will allow us to move forward with the, the cultivation on the site as soon as we can and begin our formal design and construction process as soon as we can here. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea Nisfaro. 
Thanks very much, Chris. Chris, Chris, would it be possible to send us a copy of this uh, PowerPoint if you haven't done that already? Since I will. We're reviewing it. No problem. Thanks. You could just send it to ZBA <clears throat> at Waitley.org. Yeah. Will do. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, you should, and you'll have that. Uh, Chris, if you could, if you could send that to them right now, that'd be great. No problem. Right. Um, uh, just for the record, my name is Andy Nusaforo. I'm an attorney here in Massachusetts. And um, as Chris mentioned, since you know 2015 or so, I've represented 20 or so cannabis applicants in Massachusetts, both before municipal boards like this one and before the State Cannabis Control Commission. Um, and I think Chris has covered the um, what's happened so far, but you know, he, he, I think it's worth emphasizing that in March 2021, this board issued a special permit for indoor greenhouse cannabis cultivation for uh, uh, that use at this property. That special permit's on record. And so today we're here to ask the ZBA for a variance with respect to the same use on the same property. And you know, in particular, what we're asking uh, is that the ZBA eliminate the requirement that the cultivation activity occur in structures that were in existence in April, 2018. And that's the applicable language in the bylaw. Effectively, what we're asking is, we're asking that the ZBA allow us to use new structures to engage in the same permitted cultivation activity at the same place. And I'd like to talk about the law in just a minute and I'll walk through the power that, that we believe that you have as a ZBA. But before I do that, I, was, I wanted to say just a couple things about the growing of indoor cannabis generally. Um, there is a, um, a rather a common misconception and I see it on municipal boards throughout Massachusetts. There's this common mis misconception that growing cannabis is akin to growing lettuce or flowers. And uh, I assure you that it is not. Um, cannabis cultivation, particularly the cultivation of small batch premium cannabis like this, uh, requires a high degree of control. The cultivator and the operators of the cultivation facility have to control temperature, uh, airflow, heat, humidity, pests, mold, mildew, spores, and in this, you know, of course, order, odor, and uh, security. And this kind of control requires infrastructure that can support all those kinds of control. And, you know, these, the facts of indoor cultivation um, really drives the request for the variants that we're making today. Um, you know, un under 40A and under the bylaw, the ZBA has the power to grant the variants. And I know that you all know the three elements, but you as a board would have to be able to satisfy all three of the elements here. Um, the first is that a literal enforcement of the bylaw would impose a substantial hardship. Um, second, that the hardship is owing the circumstances relating to the property and especially affecting the land of the structures, but not affecting the entirety of the zoning district. And the third element, and again, you'd have to find all three of these, is that the variance could be issued without harming the public good or undermining the purpose of the bylaw. And um, you know, in just a moment, we'll hear from uh, the site engineers, the Allegroni team, and from uh, Lazinski, the uh, greenhouse builder. But I respectfully will suggest to you that once you hear from them and consider the law, you'll find that a, a variance uh, makes a heck of a lot of sense and is something that you can, you can grant here. But I just want to put a little bit of meat on the bones of each of those three elements. Um, First, with respect to the first element, there really doesn't seem to be any question that without a variance, the applicant and the owner here would face a very substantial hardship. It's, it's hard to see how this project could proceed successfully using the existing structures. Um, you'll see in some of the photos and hear from some of the testimony that the glass, the frames, the foundations, the floors, heating systems, other systems within the structures will not support the indoor greenhouse cultivation project that we're proposing here. And um, if somehow it could, the cost and the operational challenges associated with that would be very substantial hardships. Um, I think it's also safe to say that, you know, we've been before this board before for special permit and the, the board in its wisdom imposed some performance standards on us. And particularly with respect to odor and security, um, the existing structures really don't lend themselves to meeting those performance standards as well as we could. And, and you know, furthermore, um, and this may not be directly relevant to the decision that the board is going to have to make today, but it's hard for me to imagine that the Cannabis Control Commission 
um, would allow this proposed activity, activity to go forward, given the placement of the buildings and the odor and security characteristics of the structures. So that's element number one. Um, with respect to the second element, that is the hardship owing to the circumstances and conditions of the property, uh, these circumstances are distinctive to the existing structures. Uh, obviously, they don't affect all of the structures in the AR1 zone in town. It's very distinctive of these prop to this property. Uh, the structures are obsolete. It's hard to see that they can uh, support the permitted use. And the structures are placed in a very odd configuration. I know that the board has done a site visit. Um, the configuration of these structures on the property would impose a significant financial hardship and operational hardships on the applicant. Um, and you know the engineers could get into this more, but uh, the sprawling mechanical systems, electrical, plumbing, odor mitigation systems, those could be uh, significant hardships and very detrimental to the business and to the performance standards. Um, and lastly, uh, with respect to the public benefit, um, the bylaw allows this kind of cultivation activity in this zone right now. It's been permitted, and there are significant public benefits associated with it. Um, if, in, if the board were to grant the variance, and I hope that you do, um, some of those benefits include aesthetic improvement of the property, uh, tax revenue, employment, employment opportunities for local people, and so forth. So I think it's safe to say, and you'll hear from uh, some other folks after me, that there's plenty of evidence here to support the issuance of the variance, and, and I hope that you can grant it. Um, you know, but before I turn it back over to Chris, there is one thing I wanted to, to mention. And I know there are some folks on this board that have been active on this board and have served for many years. And some of you may in fact be familiar with the Johnson versus Board of Appeals and Wareham case, but I really did want to bring it to your attention again. Um, it's a 1972 case. And in that particular case, a church group sought a variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals in the town of Wareham. And the church was an old church. It had outlived its usefulness. The congregation had merged with a different congregation. People were on their way in a different place. The church sat in an AR zone. And the church proposed a variance, sought a variance to put that church to office use. And the Zoning Board of Appeals allowed it. Uh, some neighbors objected and went all the way up to the SJC. And the language that the SJC adopted applies directly to this case, I would respectfully suggest. And um, I want to read some of that language to you. The SJC, the SJC found that conditions especially affecting the locus and the old church building created a hardship not applicable to the zoning district generally. And the court found uh, that it is unrealistic to consider that the property could be used for the intended purpose. Um, the, the Johnson case is directly on point. Um, certainly, uh, in, in our view, you've got the power under the bylaw, certainly under Chapter 40A. The cases are with you, and there's plenty of evidence to support um, the issuance of a variance. And we certainly hope that you, uh, that you can get there. So why don't I just, I'll take any questions that you might have, or I can turn it back to Chris, and he can continue with the presentation. Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm actually unfamiliar with the Johnson case, and I'm eager to look at it, um, which I can do through Westlaw. Um, so thank you for pointing that out to me. Uh, well, I guess I've got one question. Um, so maybe it's two, part A and part B. <clears throat> Didn't Mr. Smitty say you have provisional uh, CCC approval, but yet you said that it's unlikely CCC would, would grant the um, approval given the, the shape of those greenhouses. Yes, ex excellent question. Um, the applicant has secured something called provisional approval. The sequence of events that happen at the CCC include the following. First, the applicant has to submit a completed application, which is harder than it sounds because they submit an initial application and then there's an iterative process that goes between the CCC and the applicant until that application is deemed complete. So these folks have submitted a completed application and then upon review of the documents, the CCC issued a provisional certificate. There are two remaining steps. One is a final certificate, 
And the final step would be a commence operations letter, which is a specific permission that allows the applicant having satisfied all the CCC's requirements to commence operation. What happens between the provisional certificate stage and the final certificate stage is the actual rendering of something called architectural review. And this will be an actual drawing, an engineered drawing of the facility submitted to the CCC. The CCC will look at it, and once they receive it, they will then come out and do a post-provisional walkthrough on the property to determine whether what they see on paper actually complies with the regulations as written. Typically, uh, what the CCC will do is after they receive that architectural rendering and some other things, they'll come to the site, they'll walk through, and then they will generate something called an RFI. And the RFI is a request for information. So they'll ask a series of questions to the applicant, and then they can re relate to any number of issues within the application. The applicant must satisfy them before the CCC comes back for final approval. So it is true that we have provisional licensure at this point, but we certainly don't have the CCC's approval to proceed to build or commence operations. Okay, thank you. That answers that question. <clears throat> well, then here's another question, um, which is, how did you get this far along with, uh, with us and getting a special permit and the other approvals from town without realizing that these greenhouses were insufficient for your purposes? Yeah, uh, th things changed for sure once Allegroni and Lazinski came. Um, uh, we really began to appreciate, based on their analysis of the property, just how deficient these are. Um, I, I don't pretend to have any particular you know, real estate or construction expertise. Chris may have some of that, but whatever we have pales in comparison to what Allegroni and Lazinski bring to the table. And once they went to the site, examined the premises, they came back with a report, a portion of which you can see in this presentation, that really um, made us sharpen our pencils. That's really why we're here. To add to that, you know, the special permit was a, it was a key stage of the process where um, we felt comfortable proceeding and actually spending some significant dollars and in investing in these key partnerships that I just mentioned earlier. So um, once we did that, um, this became very evident that we need to uh, go in a different direction. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so hopefully uh, Dave Lazinski is on the line here and can, can go through the next slide. Dave, are you on? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm on. Go for it. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Um, assessment of the greenhouses that are there. Um, I looked at them this spring, and um, there's a, a lot of uh, wood rot on them. There's a lot of uh, steel deterioration and um, deterioration of the um, foundations, plus uh, a lot of glasses slipped, uh, just very outdated um, greenhouses. Uh, they're pretty much past the point of return as far as trying to uh, repair them. To try and repair them would, I would say, um, the cost would out, outlive the means at this point. Um, uh, the uh, and they are scattered around. They're not uh, very um, efficient as far as trying to uh, work in them, as far as labor, and also uh, heating them. Uh, the, the new the new greenhouses are much more efficient. Um, so uh, that's what we've uh, assessed. And since I looked at them, I have uh, actually worked for a cannabis grower and seeing exactly what they need, what their needs are. And these old greenhouses are completely inadequate for cannabis growing. Um, it was kind of a bit of an eye opener for me too. But uh, what they need uh, is what, what has been said already about temperature, airflow, humidity, all that. It's very, very concise. It's not just that they're, you know, growing weed, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, a very um, um, scientific uh, <laughs> process that they go through. Anybody else have any questions for me? I'm, I'm, I'm just reiterating what Roger asked in his second question. Um, this seems 
late in the process to have done this kind of work, especially after coming for a special permit. Um, this is essentially a wholesale redesign of this project and it's just framing my consideration of it. And I think again, um, previously, you know, this is new, new to us too, right? This was a new process for us. My father and I were finally getting to the point where we're engaging the proper professionals. I think the gentleman we had previously that was our head cultivator uh, really didn't have the experience that is, is necessary to um, properly design and, and execute on, on the grow. And we've got a new head grower that has really, really good experience. We actually went out to his facilities in Maine. He knows what he's doing. And I think that opened our eyes. And then we got the Allegroni folks involved and Andrea's firm has done so much with cannabis and all of that kind of, um, you know, led us to this, this stage of the game where we say, okay, we need to move forward with this new plan um, at the site to do this right. We want to abide by the odor uh, concerns. We want to abide by the security concerns. We want to make this look nice. And we want to have a, a viable project that uh, we can we can do good for the town and be good neighbors. So um, I understand the question, um, and, and you know, realistically, this is new to us, right? So if we could do this all over again, we'd certainly do it differently. But we're trying to do our best to make this project work. And I think we have a viable project here that we can do. And um, that's that's where we are now. Yeah, I, I, if, if I could just uh, chime in here with something. Um, one of the things, once Chris and I started working together on this, one of the first things I noticed in the special permit was the best available technology requirement for odor mitigation. And you know we take that seriously. That is not uncommon. We see it in municipal permits all over Massachusetts. And if you put that requirement of best available technology and odor mitigation together with the existing structures, near the two shall meet. So as we were thinking about you know, coming back before you, one of the things we really thought about is would we be able to satisfy the performance standards built into that special permit using the existing structures as they stand? And I think it's safe to say, you'll hear from David and perhaps from the Allegoni folks that it would be very difficult to do that. Could, could you please describe what the new greenhouses would look like, how they would be designed? I, you may have done it before, in other correspondence, but could you repeat that, please? Uh, sure. Perhaps the Allegroni folks could could help with that. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, this is uh, for the record, Anthony Allegroni uh, speaking, um, principal architect of the project. Uh, also on the call, as as Chris um, had mentioned earlier, Lou Allegroni as well, principal Allegroni companies were the. We're the design builder for the project, so we operate as both uh, architect and uh, construction manager. Um, and so we 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 guide the project from a management standpoint through you know early feasibility, uh, which is essentially the phase that we are in now, and seeking a variance uh, through design and then uh, and, and through to, to construction. Um, so at this point in the process, to answer the question. Um, you know, we are at a, a, uh, a stage of design where we have established the design intent. Uh, and as we get further along in this presentation, we'll show you, uh, you know, a, a couple uh, site plans to help you understand the orientation of the greenhouses, you know, the orientation of the other structures on the property in, in comparison to the existing structures. Uh, but we're, you know, we're not going to pretend that this project is fully designed right now and fully engineered right now. Uh, that process has to be taken in place. What, what we can tell you is, is the design intent, which we will go through. Um, but uh, in, unless we seek this variance, you know, ultimately, uh, the, the project would not be feasible. Um, and so, you know, we wouldn't typically advise our client to you know, spend the dollars, spend the time, spend the effort uh, to uh, fully design a project prior to receiving, um, you know, the variance and the proper procedures in place in order to, you know, allocate a build uh, and receive a building permit and ultimately begin construction. So, you know, staying true to the process, uh, we're, we're at the beginning stages um, and much work has been done from the feasibility end, uh, but there is much work to be done 
uh, from uh, you know, a design and engineering standpoint. Um, so we really can't fully answer you know, the question of exactly you know, and precisely what these greenhouses will look like. Um, you know, and we're, we're open, open to continuing that conversation, uh, but perhaps explaining the, you know, the orientation of the greenhouses on site will help you better understand uh, what that intent is. Are, are you aware of the definition of a greenhouse in our zoning bylaws? Um, can you repeat that, please? Are you aware of the definition of a greenhouse in our zoning bylaws? Uh, pertaining to seeking a, a variance? No, to a marijuana establishment. We have a definition for a, a, region, a green, greenhouse is, is a structure primarily of glass or sheets of clear plastic with no concrete flooring in which temperature humidity can be controlled. So if, if you're proposing something that's more than, than uh, or, or that it has concrete flooring and, and other conditions, is that still a greenhouse or is that a, a structure for a building? Is it more than, more than just a greenhouse? Okay, I understood. I, I think you'll find that we're proposing something very much you know, in line with that. Um, you know, a, a greenhouse by its very nature and its, and its function of course would have to, uh, you know, I agree, it would have to have those, those characteristics. Um, so I, th I think you'll find that we are we are proposing in line with the with that definition. Um, so, of course, this this greenhouse will include just to be more specific, the greenhouses will be made of either some combination of glass or polycarbonate. Is it one ply polycarbonate? Is it two, three, four, or five poly uh, ply polycarbonate? We don't know. Um, that has to be factored into the engineering analysis. Uh, that has to do with our R values and our overall thermal envelope uh, based on what specific engineering systems are going to be integrated into this design. Um, so there's really things that we can't nail down with 100% certainty right now um, in, in regards to the precise materials until we get in further into the design and engineering, which of course we will. Um, upon, uh, you know, after seeking this variance. Um, but uh, uh, of course they will be greenhouse by their, greenhouses by their nature. Um, this, these, this facility is intended to fully uh, harvest natural light and uh, be passive to a certain extent. So this is not an indoor uh, growing facility where, you know, of opaque walls where it's, it's uh, the cannabis is produced entirely with grow lights and uh, uh, strictly engineering and technology uh, to mitigate the indoor temperature uh, alone. Uh, these will be greenhouses that have translucent uh, material, again, whether it's polycarbonate or uh, double glazing or triple glazing, uh, that still be to be determined. Uh, but that is that that is absolutely part of the design intent. Does that help answer your question? It kind of does for now, but I, I guess we'll wait to see what your final design is. I just like to see what your final design is at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we will we will absolutely show you the final design. You know this this. The, this, the, you know, what we are talking about here is to deliver to you the design intent, you know, again, I don't mean to repeat myself, but the design intent for this project so that we can explain, you know, our intention is to remove some of the structures due to the existing conditions and replace those structures with new structures in a different orientation. Uh, that's really what we're here to explain today. If that is allowable, then we will proceed, you know, with, with the process. And just to jump in, if I could just introduce Devin to Devin, can you just talk quickly about some of the uh, minutes we reviewed from the 2018 uh, planning board, I believe it was? Yes, uh, I just wanted to uh, quickly address that. I think the question was addressed to uh, the issue of concrete floors. Um, I, I believe it was uh, Robert Smith, a current member of the zoning board who had addressed that and said, uh, something to the effect of, well, the applicant can always seek a variance, uh, which is precisely why we're before the board today. 
is uh, we're seeking a variance to allow uh, us to go forward with a grow operation that uh, addresses, um, you know, having uh, greenhouses that are able to be economically feasible, which is going to require uh, that everything be controlled as uh, Attorney Nusiporo indicated with temperature control, odor control, noise control. Um, and I, I think the, the board squarely addressed that fact and said, applicants will need to come before the board for a variance, which is precisely why we're here today. Excuse me, please. Could I have the date of those minutes, please? Uh, April 17th, 2018. Thank you. Well, let me back up a little bit. First of all, who was speaking there? Uh, sorry, this is uh, Attorney Devin Grierson with New Sephora Law Group. Okay. So you're talking about the planning board meeting uh, when they were adopting the bylaw? Uh, I believe it was the, the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, no, no, I, think, discussion. I, I, I think Devin, I think it's a, I think it's a planning board meeting, April 17th, 2018, I believe, which I have right here. I, think it, I, I believe you're correct, um, Roger, with, with the adoption of the, of the bylaws, I believe, but I don't have it in front of me. So you're, you're talking about the, um, it's almost like the legislative history of our bylaws, if I'm understanding you. And you're asking us to consider, what was it, a public comment that happened to have been made by one of our ZBA members at that public hearing? That is, that is correct, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm looking at the April 17th, 2018 minutes of planning board meeting town of Waitley. And uh, um, the discussion, there's, there's a lot here, but the discussion is, um, large versus craft cultivators. And in the midst of that, uh, Bob Smith, uh, and I don't want to put anyone's words in their mouth, but uh, of the Zoning Board of Appeals noted that a grower could apply for a variance and it related to a variety of, of items here. So, you know, perhaps the, perhaps the Zoning Board could revisit that. that that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, in looking at this, we wanted to, you know, bring to the board's attention the legislative history here to see if it would lend some support to the variance application. All right, so as a lawyer, we often, um, when we review cases, we see the court talking about legislative history when they're trying to decide why a statute was passed. Um, and, you know, there are two schools about legislative history. One school is try to figure out what the legislative body was thinking of when they, when they passed the law. But another school, which I actually subscribe to is it doesn't matter because once the once the law or the bylaw is passed, that's it. And then the uh, the future bodies that are interpreting that uh, law go by the plain language of the of the law or the bylaw in this case. So we're the interpretive body at this point, three years later, uh, <clears throat> to call out that Bob Smith happened to be as a good citizen at that meeting and, and happened to throw out the word variance. Uh, as a general proposition to me, it just doesn't carry any weight as to what we should be doing tonight. But that's no, just, I agree. That's just my personal opinion about that, but go ahead. Uh, perhaps I could, uh, if you don't mind, jump in. Um, this is Lewis Allegroni with, with Allegroni Companies. Um, uh, Frederick's point of um, defining the, the greenhouse, I think is a good one. Um, I think that's really why we here we are here tonight is just to, to gain uh, clarity as to not only what the intent of the bylaw is, but you know what is the intent with the structures, and you know back, backing up to, to Deborah's point, which is a good one also, is how did we get to this point, and how did the team get to this point, and and Chris's answer of um, you know going down due diligence and engaging partners, part of our process as as Anthony has alluded to. Is is establishing what are the what are the constraints of, and what is the constructability aspects uh, in in our preliminary analysis, and, and in doing that, of course, we uncovered these questions. You know, what what are we trying to do here? Uh, clearly, it says the reuse of existing greenhouses. Um, uh, to everyone on the board's point here, 
I think that's very much understood um, from the team's perspective and ours. And, and that's really what, what brought us down this road of ultimately, um, you know, a variance may, if, if, if you folks elect to think it's the proper uh, direction, allow us to take a better, um, more accurate and diligent approach to, uh, to the final outcome of what um, we think was, was ex accepted via, via the special permit process. So, you know, like Anthony said, um, we're certainly not um, down the design road far enough to answer uh, questions as it relates to specific uh, design and structure and engineering HVAC systems order mitigation. And that's really how we ended up in the position we are now is um, our process is to look at those things, establish the objectives, uh, talk about program. And um, after speaking with, with Nick, the cultivator and understanding what these requirements really are um, and looking at the site, uh, it was very clear that uh, trying to define a, a design direction was very difficult. Um, so, you know, that, that started us going down the path of how do we take, how do we look at reusing these? Do, are they reuse um, how they sit now? And ultimately <laughs> we look at the greenhouses and, and with, with Dave's input also from a, from a glazing perspective and his years of experience with green in particular, um, really resulted in um, the greenhouses themselves, of course, are going to require substantial repair and replacement. Uh, now, and, and Anthony's and the team's analysis in our company, uh, that brings us to what are we setting these on? And, and we're setting these on foundations that, that have failed. Um, you know, the, the greenhouses have served a useful life um, and served uh, the LaSalle's, the family, well over many decades. Um, but it's very clear that they're the, at the end of their life cycle. Um, and they're probably at the end of their life cycle, even in its current use and current business. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're here also just to gain clarity and, you know, what is the best approach here so that we can ultimately end up with what we think has been approved um, by the board uh, to ultimately end up with a professional uh, product, uh, an, an aesthetic that the town is expecting, uh, an operation that the town is and that's, you know, really, like Anthony said, that's what we're tasked with is, is, is taking this programming and feasibility phase as step one. And we found ourselves here uh, because the constraints um, that were before us on site really didn't lend us to a, to a definitive direction. So I just wanted to make that clear um, to Frederick's point, you know, what is a greenhouse? Um, absolutely. You know, the intent here is to replace the greenhouses. And that's, that's Nick, uh, the cultivator and the team's um, goal, and that's the goal that we're tasked with with implementing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's good good images. I, I think many of the folks are, are I assume, are familiar with the site. Um, great property, uh, very known property, um, but the buildings at this point uh, really need substantial um, repair. And after getting into the structure, you know, just one aspect of the design uh, that we would have to analyze, we can't put anything on them again. Um, so we're essentially tasked with, under the current special permit, um, you know, replacing or, or somehow restructuring what's already there, um, which is ultimately going to result in a, a complete removal uh, and replacement. And after looking at a complete removal and replacement and understanding the program that the team is trying to achieve, uh, it would be advantageous uh, to, to lay these, these greenhouses out and design them, you know, in a more efficient and, and economical manner. Um, so again, I just wanted to jump in and kind of provide that clarity because I think it's, it's, it's very relevant and in, in to share that context of um, what Deborah said is how did we get here? And admittedly, we thought the same. All right, so let me, let me focus on something. Uh, the words of your application say, to issue a variance to relieve the obligation of the applicant to utilize buildings in existence, et cetera. So if I'm understanding now, based on what I'm hearing is, are you only here tonight asking us for the variance to relieve you of the application, but you're not here 
asking us to approve specific greenhouses. Is that, is that the idea, Councillor? Andrea, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, it, it is. Uh, we we would we would anticipate um, if if the board were to grant the variance, we would come back before you with a special permit application, and then more precisely define what we're seeking a special permit for. Well, that that makes things more clear so that you're not asking us to focus on any particular greenhouses um, and you're simply asking for the legal declaration of of the uh, the relief as you call it um, so that in theory we could grant the variance and deny your next special permit application if we didn't like it. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, theoretically, you could do that. Uh, okay. I, 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 I mean, I think what we're really what we're really focusing on today is that notion of existing in April two thousand eighteen. Okay. Well, that, the, the focus is good. Um, then is it even worthwhile for me to ask how many greenhouses, how many square feet, or is that just really? beyond what you're asking us to think about tonight. Uh, Chris, well, step on the screen, actually, you have an answer there. Yeah, I think if we can go through the next slide, next few slides, yes. that may clear up some of uh, the questions you may ask. And, and if Lou or, Lou or Anthony, I'm not yeah, sure. I, I can jump in here again. Uh, Anthony Allegroni speaking again. So uh, on, on this slide here, so we talked about the existing conditions. Uh, Lou went through that a bit, and, and, and Chris, uh, uh, browse through the photos for you. I know everybody's very familiar with the site, uh, but ultimately what you know we're getting at here is that uh, considering renovating the structures uh, simply isn't feasible. Uh, you know, they're at the end of their life cycle. Um, and so looking at these structures from a, you know, a building code perspective and a uh, proper engineering practice perspective, um, it simply would entail new construction um, in order to 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 make these structures uh, viable, um, you know, functional and and ultimately energy efficient and and operational uh, for a, a cannabis facility, and uh, so existing versus new building coverage. Um, so existing being what, what we're saying here is that the existing buildings cover uh, approximately twenty nine thousand square feet uh, of, of building coverage on the lot now. Uh, what we're proposing is roughly the same at 32,000 square feet. Um, so the point being is that considering the renovation, you know, if you, we were to call it a renovation, would entail ultimately, realistically, it would entail new construction. Um, what we're proposing is really not any more extensive than what it would be if we were to, um, you know, proceed with uh, what would we, we would consider a renovation. Um, so existing first proposed, you know, is really, um, you know, equ equivalent uh, on that level. Um, the 30% max building coverage allowed, um, that's, a, that's a zoning requirement um, for, for reference, you know, uh, which is around 188,000 square feet technically allowed, um, uh, which we are, of course, well below that and the existing conditions uh, are well below that. So we're really nestling ourselves into um, uh, you know, proposing to, to uh, develop this property uh, in a similar manner than what would be required if, if, uh, uh, if the existing structures were to be renovated. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Chris. So here's the existing conditions plan. Um, so I know everybody's familiar with this. Uh, so here's the layout of the existing buildings. The, the white blocks that you can see, um, as you know, those are the existing greenhouses. Um, and that uh, central darker line, that's sort of an L configuration, that's the existing uh, structure or existing um, you know, residential looking structure or head house for the sake of conversation um, uh, on the existing property. And so as you can see, the greenhouses uh, in the arrangement of them, as, as others have mentioned, are oriented in a very uh, inefficient way from an overall staff operation standpoint. And so understanding the existing conditions and understanding what would be entailed to create these greenhouses uh, and, and make them operational, um, uh, you know, we would propose to modify the layout of, of these, these greenhouses that differs from 
uh, what you're currently seeing in the existing conditions. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Chris, uh, to our proposed intent. So let me explain what this drawing is showing a little bit so we're all on the same page. So the, the diagonal dashed area that you can see, um, which ultimately is called out as the existing buildings um, in, in that area to be removed. Uh, so that, that land coverage is, you know, approximately 43, uh, or excuse me, 46,000 square feet. So that hatch pattern there uh, is, is, is representing where the existing structures currently are. Um, and then the, the square block that you see overlaid on top of that, that is, that is what our proposed design intent uh, is to be for uh, the new facility. So as you can see, it includes five greenhouses oriented, uh, essentially stacked in the north south direction. Uh, and then it includes the head house, which is directly to the east and connected to those five greenhouses. And so what we're doing is we're taking an equivalent footprint um, that is comparable to the existing facility and condensing that, uh, reducing the sprawl uh, for overall efficiency purposes from not only staff operations, but overall energy efficiencies. Um, and really condensing this and uh, overall, we feel aesthetically, you know, you know, overall in improving the site. And so, um, again, from uh, in regards to existing versus new and um, what would be you know, required to bring these greenhouses up to uh, building code standards, engineering and overall operational um, uh, uh, success, uh, really the, the, the new construction is, is comparable to what would need to be done. Uh, so at this point, um, happy to answer any questions that's not clear or may not be clear on this drawing in regards to existing versus new. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Anthony, if I could just chime in with something quickly. Yeah. Um, I think the question might have pertained to what these would look like. That is how they would appear. Yeah. You know, and and I, I wonder if you can, I know that I don't want to put you on the spot here because I know you haven't, you don't have these designed sure. to a particular degree, but uh, is it safe to say that these are going to appear to be greenhouses with the, the standard characteristics like glass and frame and steel and peaks and things of that nature? Absolutely. Uh, 100%. These are the, the five uh, structures that you see there uh, towards the west end oriented, as I said, stacked north to south. Those are all the proposed uh, glass structures. Um, so those are consistent with, you know, the definition of a greenhouse that uh, was explained earlier. Um, and again, glass, polycarbonate, uh, you know, translucent um, uh, uh, panel uh, glazing. But aren't you, I, I, I'm still, I'm just confused. What, what are we supposed to be acting on to demolish the existing greenhouses? Because they say they're not asking us for comment on the design of the new ones. And if that's true, do we really need to take a variance to demolish existing greenhouses? Because the, the write-up for the, I don't know what it said for their application or the public hearing, what I saw was it was demolish existing greenhouses and replace with modern with with modern ones. I, I, I mean, if we agree on that, we're agreeing to they can replace them with modern ones, and and I don't think we have enough information to determine that. Um, I, I guess I guess what we're asking you for, if I could try to provide some clarity, because I know that there's some there's could clearly be some confusion. We are requesting that the Zoning Board of Appeals relieve us from the requirement that we use existing structures. That's what we're asking for. And as I said before, we would come back before you uh, and, and put in front of you a more robust reflection of what we're proposing at the site as part of a special permit application.
Well, you know, our, our bylaws talk about the, there's, I guess, two conditions. One is replacing existing greenhouses before they were in existence on what, 2018? And the other existing is, is greenhouses on new location. And I don't know whether you're proposing one or both. I mean, all these aren't replacing, yeah, they're replacing existing, but not at the same location. The same parcel, yes, but the exact location on the parcel, no. Right, it, it, it is true that- Location. Yeah, that, that's right. We, we, are not, we are not seeking to place all four square of these greenhouses precisely where they sit today. As right. you can see, we're, we're proposing using the same specific vicinity of the property. This is, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a 10 plus acre parcel. You can see we're proposing to place the greenhouses roughly in the same, actually precisely in the same vicinity of the existing structures. So how, how does this affect the special permit that you've already been granted? Are you asking for that to be just vacated? It, it's on record. It's, I mean, it's, yes, it is. And, and that's, I mean, you asked for a special permit in very specific terms with the existing greenhouses. And that's, you know, that's what I'm struggling to reconcile here. Yeah, we, we did, and, and you granted it. Um, yes. So, yeah, so we, I may be able to answer that question. Um, sure. So the, the special permit specifically states that uh, the applicant can utilize three greenhouses in existence. Uh, so if the variance were granted, uh, we would no longer be utilizing buildings in existence. So I, I think the, the special permit would not be applicable uh, and wouldn't be able to utilize it because if we tore down the buildings, then they would no longer be in existence. So to reiterate, you'd have to return with a new special permit application. That is our understanding. So one thing that we haven't mentioned here, but the problem that they have is that they are in the AR1 zone. So yes. that the, um, if you look at the table of uses, by special permit in AR1, you are allowed to be a marijuana cultivator if you use those greenhouses in existence, et cetera. Uh, but if you go up one box on the chart, you can be an indoor marijuana cultivator in the AR2 zone by special permit without using an existing greenhouse. But if you are in AR1, there's a big no there. You can't even get a special permit to be an indoor marijuana cultivator in AR1. So the only way to be a uh, marijuana cultivator in AR1, as it's currently written, is through the use of existing greenhouses. So, so that's the, the nub of their problem. They're in AR1. So the only way to do it is to get a variance. Well, if you want, if you don't want to use an existing greenhouse, right? And you want to build a new greenhouse for AR one, you got to get a variance, right? To do it. That, that's our analysis exactly. Yeah. So that so that they've chosen, you know, as a matter of strategy, to use a, a two-step process, or I guess it'd be a three-step process if, if you count the part that already happened, but a two-step process: seek a variance, see if we'd even agree to it, and then if we did. Then they know they can spend the money and get a nice fancy design or efficient design, let's call it that, and then and then seek the special permit and then show us, as ordinarily any applicant would, detailed plans and presumably the planning board too, right? Because you're not in front of the planning board on this variant. That's the territory of the ZBA. Um, so, I mean, from a big picture, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, dynamic because. Here they're saying, um, hey, look, board members, now that we've investigated this, if we use those old greenhouses, there's maybe a lot of odor that gets out into the public, uh, which we, amongst ourselves, have acknowledged is a bad thing. So what they're saying, I guess, is uh, we want to do a good thing. We want to keep the odor intact, but the only way we can do it is by utilizing modern greenhouses but we're in the AR1 zone, 
so we can't use those greenhouses unless it gives a variance. So that, that's, I think, my way of summarizing what what we are hearing, which is certainly not not an everyday application that we we deal with. So we have to think about it to be sure. Um, now, of course, the big problem is we grant variances very sparingly, and that's by virtue of what we understand state law to be. That's why I'm interested in this Johnson case, because apparently it deals with a structure and most variances we deal with are more use of the land. It's in that way. Topography generally comes into the equation. Um, so that's just my, my wheels turning and that's where I'm landing at the moment. Yeah, I mean, my wheels are turning. I mean, I see your logic there, Roger, and I certainly always keep an open mind. Um, but even in the PowerPoint presentation showing the most derelict possible view of the greenhouses, those would have been evident to you when you made the application for a special permit. And it is striking to me that you wouldn't have recognized then that these were unusable structures and that perhaps the initial request should have been for a variance instead of coming at it as, as a special permit. And that's a little troubling to me. I'm not saying that it's it doesn't allow me to consider what's come before me, but it is troubling. I think if I could respond to that, Mr. Chairman, I, I understand that sentiment completely. Um, it is true that had we had, I think if I had been involved, if Allegroni had been involved initially, certainly if we would talk to Luzinski, the builder, we might have taken a different tack when it came to applying for a special permit that eight or nine months or 10 months ago. Um, we've had now the benefit of that analysis. And there are two, in particular, two performance standards that, that you know, I think we should reiterate here. Number one is odor control. It's been discussed. It'd be, it'd be a very tough performance standard for us to meet given the existing greenhouses. And the second is security. And that you know, is something that arises under your bylaw, but it is uber important with the CCC. So it, try it to meet the performance standards around here. That, that's, re that's really why we decided to take the tact that we're taking at this date. Uh, but, but you make two excellent points. And those were points that we brought up in the special permit process. And the permit was extended because your clients said that they could meet those standards. And so the fact that they felt they could meet them then and now feel that they can't now um, is it just gives me pause. So let me ask you this, where are you in the purchase process with LaSalle? I suppose you still, you haven't closed yet. You're still waiting for your permit process to play out. Chris? Correct. Right, so we're, um, we have a, a series of contingent um, steps in the process of the purchase and um, getting to the final step is the, is the final um, where we'll close on the property. So we're still, still We have a hand raised, Roger, Nicholas and Margaret. Okay, yes, I recognize you. I don't know whether you're up to the point where you're willing to take public comment yet. Yes, we are. Okay, my name is Margaret Christie. I live in the center of town. I sit on the Ag Commission here in Waitley. I wanna be clear that I'm not speaking for the Ag Commission, but just to give you that background. And I just wanna speak um, briefly about the potential community benefits of the legalization of cannabis cultivation. Um, I think we've seen tonight that uh, there's a lot of, there's clear benefits for lawyers and engineers and designers, and that's fine. That's, you know, provides economic benefit to all of us and, and job creation. But another constituency that I would really like to see benefit from this is farmers. And I think um, somebody just mentioned John LaSalle and the LaSalle family. Like a lot of farmers, they have worked very hard in a business that um, often doesn't provide a huge payback in a financial sense, but that stewards our open land and provides community benefits in the form of jobs or food, or in this case, flowers that are valuable to all of us, but doesn't always um, 
provide a really clear path forward, particularly in a financial sense, if the farm is, you know, gets to the point where they're ready to move on to something else in their life, a new enterprise or to retirement. And I think cannabis has the potential for some farmers to make that path forward more clear. And I think in an agricultural community like Waitley, that's, uh, that's a really important potential benefit. And so I just want to speak to um, the value of this project for a property that's a little bit unusual and could be difficult to, you know, figure out um, the next step um, in other kinds of agriculture, but I think is a really good fit for cannabis. As you all can know and can see from this map, you know, it's kind of squeezed in there between the highway and five and 10 and the river. And so there are not lots and lots and lots of neighbors. Um, so in that sense, I think it's a good place, you know, for a cannabis operation. Um, and as I said, I, I just think this is an important new avenue for farmers um, to increase uh, their options, you know, if they're ready to move on or to diversify their operations. I think we're all figuring out how to do it. Um, and so some flexibility, you know, is, is really warranted. So I guess I just want to, you know, urge you to consider that um, as another factor in making a decision about whether to, you know, demonstrate some flexibility in this case. So I, I'm supportive. Thank you. Yep. Because Roger, I'd like to see a, a drawing showing where the AR1, the 400 foot for AR1 appears on this site and, and where's the restrictions for the, the wetland, I guess, for the river going here to see exactly how much property is, uh, is available for, for greenhouses and is this the best or the only location? <laughs> I, I don't know, just by looking at a map and saying, this is where we want it, I guess to me doesn't answer them questions. So um, on the petitioner side, does anybody have a map showing the AR1, AR2 designation or demarcation? Yes, there's the AR1, AR2 designation. And I'd ask the Allegroni team to correct me if I'm wrong, is that's it. Sure. Yeah. You see my cursor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So AR2 is over here, AR1's from here over. So once again, basically the land that's in AR2 is the river. There's a small portion of that. Trust me, we've looked at this a million times. There's a small portion that is in AR2 that is uh, potentially usable, but not, not great, um, not very efficient. There so is a, um, Chris, just to throw, uh, to add to that for clarity, there's a, um, that buffer zone that you see there circling it, that's a 200 foot uh, riverfront resource. Right. That's area. the riverine zone, uh, 200 foot buffer. The typical conservation land has a 100 foot buffer, which I believe is on the plan also. Um, for that reason, and you know, really to uh, to attempt to minimize any disruption to the resource area, and um, going um, back for uh, conservation commission approval, uh, the proposed footprint that you see on the plan is is really you know, pushed uh, over uh, purposefully. <laughs> That's correct. Um, you can see on the east side is the, the zoning setback, uh, that dark uh, dashed line. Uh, so we're approximately 50 feet uh, from that setback. So in between, in between the setback and the, uh, the riparian buffer zone. If I can say uh, everything that, or just about everything we have on the property now is in AR1. So it really wouldn't be changing, you know, it wouldn't be adding into the AR1, but it would be just re repositioning the stuff in AR1. Excuse me, is that by any chance John LaSalle speaking? I can't it tell. Was. It yes, was. it is. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Roger? Yes. I, I think that um, Ms. Christie made a really compelling set of comments uh, in terms of the stewardship of the land as um, farming generations um, 
age. Uh, and it becomes, especially with this site, this is in such a unique and, and forgive me for saying it, John, a weird, you know, you got the highway, the, the, the approach to the overpass, which didn't used to be there until the late 50s. And then it, it creates this whole, that whole business of uh, where Claverack and LaSalle Drive meet is a, is a construct that comes because of Route 91. Um, I just, I, I think there is, um, com a comp that's a compelling argument for me. It's also a compelling argument that if anyone has ever been involved in renovation, um, what you think you have um, until you finally blow a hole in the wall or whatever often is not exactly what you have and field conditions here obviously proved um somewhat different than um might be thought i do agree with deborah also because some of the photographs that you are in the powerpoint <laughs> you you selected the most uh, as she said derelict looking um parts of the of the greenhouses but i do know that they're old and I, uh, and I did indeed say, um, not representing the zoning board, but as a person who is on the zoning board at that meeting three years ago, that, uh, you know, growers could apply for a variance because anybody can apply for a variance. It's just a, a matter of make your case. And I think they're beginning to make a very compelling case here. If I can speak again. Uh, that the greenhouse that's out front was built during the depression and most of the uh, the other buildings were built almost 70 years ago and they were built for a different purpose and even as we as I am trying to uh, make a continue to make a go of it now it gets just harder and harder because they're just not efficient the way they are and uh, so you know I, I as much as it pains me to say that these greenhouses need to be, you know, they are basically obsolete. Uh, 20 years ago, a um, ag engineer from uh, Yukon came to look <coughs> at the property and he, uh, he told me that that greenhouse probably should be knocked down because it was not renovatable the way it is as a modern structure. Uh, I can't get replacement glass for any of the any of the greenhouses because they don't make that size glass anymore. Um, our heating system is outdated. I burned wood chips for 35 years to uh, heat the greenhouses with steam. And, uh, you know, just everything is, is basically obsolete. And, uh, you know, it's, it's time to uh, turn it over to a modern system. Uh, the greenhouses probably uh, would be on the style or similar to the ones over on uh, Route 5 uh, by um, in the corner of Christian Lane or over on River Road. And, um, you know, it's, it's the modern style. It's the way it is. And, um, you know, I would really like to see this proposal go ahead. Uh, the Bob and Chris Samini have been forthright and um, consistent on what they are looking for. And they've, you know, uh, to me are honorable and are going to try to do the right thing. They have brought in people uh, to in um, to assist them in design and growing operations that are are top notch. And I, I do believe that this project will be a benefit to the town. Thank you, John. And John, if I could add to that, you know, I think some of the Things that were mentioned in, in the special permit as conditions uh, regard to odor, obviously we've talked about, but solar and water and energy and things like that. Um, with this new plan, we'd be able to do that. You know, again, I'm not commit, committing to it until we can get the full design done, but we'd likely be able to get it done uh, fairly you know, right off the bat here, as opposed to I believe it was a five-year requirement for uh, energy and, and solar and things like that. So we'd be able to do some of this stuff far quicker and. Um, just wanted to make that point as well. But, but thank you, John, for your, your commentary there. Is there Mr. Ludlum who's on the, uh, the line or on Zoom? Did we read his letter? There were several letters. I haven't seen his name. I've been up and down the attendees several times and I haven't seen Ludlum that appearing anywhere. But some people just have phone numbers. 
Okay, so the reason I asked is he did write uh, a couple yeah. of letters to the board. They're extensive. We're on mute. Hello. Hello. Is that oh, Mr. hi. This Mr. happens to be Stuart Lemon. Oh, well, there you are. So I was about to mention the letters you wrote, but I was preferring that you speak for yourself. So do you want to uh, comment on anything that you've heard? Oh, I have lots of comments, but the most, uh, I'm just confused. Uh, I am very confused by their uh, approach uh, here, uh, and particularly about the drawings that they show of a building. Uh, I guess it starts on page 10, then 10, 11, 12, 13, something like that. Because they show two build, uh, well, they declare they have two buildings in mind. One they would build first, and the second would be for expansion. But both buildings would be the same size. Uh, they would be 33,000 square feet. They would be 39 feet high. They would be two stories. They would be completely enclosed, I assume, so that the growing chambers would be anything but greenhouses. What? is the meaning of this design if they are now talking about regular greenhouses. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time trying to read these designs and figure out what they meant, uh, but to make a decision, we need good information. To make a decision, we should have a far better design before us that addresses the questions that the zoning board has put to the applicants now. Uh, and I you know my wife and I think that uh, under the present circumstances, either the plan that they have put forward should be denied. Uh, well, I think I'll just leave it there. It should be denied because the change between the first plan and the present plan it's very great. The area that LaSalle's place could give them for a growing marijuana was 10,000 square feet. Because those two buildings that are on page nine, the big squares, are two story, they add a total, it, they would sum up to a total of 80,000 square feet of growing space, which is eight times the original uh, application. What is exactly on these people's mind? What do they really want? We need their plan before we can actually make a decent decision. I think that's my major concern right now, that everything is up in the air. Uh, I have no idea what the plan is. I cannot look at that plan, therefore, and say, what are the environmental consequences of putting this in? Uh, what are the consequences for the Mill River, which I'm particularly interested in? After all, it flows right over the Wheatley Water District uh, recharge area. We need more information than has been given. And some of the information, it can't be false information. It costs the money to do that, uh, to make those plans for those buildings. And I might add, just out of just personal uh, thought. If they had phoned me in the first place, I could have told them those greenhouses were not usable for the ventilation system that they had put into plan one that was delivered to the zoning board in 2020. The greenhouses simply weren't up to it. They were too leaky. Thank you. He talks about page nine. Do you know what page that? Uh, I mean, I, I don't see the numbered pages that he's talking about. I, I believe he's talking about the the initial packet that was sent in with our application, which talks through some of the structures and buildings. If you put the HTML file in which you find the uh, latest request for a variance uh, on your computer screen and read it at least with, I, I don't know exactly what software I was reading. It tells you 
what page you are on. You just you can count from the beginning. Can I clarify who, who's is this a, an abutter to speak? Yes. Okay. I am an abutter. Thank you. Well, does someone have that on the screen and can they go to that page? Let's see if I can find it here. I went down nine pages and came up with, I think, the second page of the drawings. It says new proposed site plan for the LaSalle property. Which does? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no not you. That's yours here? Yeah. Okay. No, right after the last map. The map that showed the orientation of the new greenhouses. There should be a series of four or five pages. The first page shows uh, the floor plan, first floor plan, showing five greenhouses and and uh, industrial area, office areas, and so forth. It also shows the second floor. I think the page after that is a side view of the building. It might be two or three pages after that, though. It shows the building of the dimensions that I pointed out, 39 feet high and two stories. This material was sent to me by the Zoning Board of Appeals Secretary. Talking about this, can you see my screen now? This yeah. page or the page before it? Uh, I yeah. cannot see your screen. He's yeah. on the phone. He's on the I, phone. I, Okay. Well, I'm not sure which. Um, it looks like it could be page nine. Please, your your reader's calling that one the previous I, one page nine. I think he's I think he's talking about this. Uh, although I, I mean we, we'd be happy, Mr. Chairman, to walk through each of these slides, but I think he's talking about this, which is um, five. If I know it doesn't set up, it's 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 a ninety degree based on what I can see here. But it's those are the five greenhouses with an attached headhouse as depicted on. Yes. So this is the head house. Yes. Right. These would be the five greenhouses. So to your point that there's not 80,000 square feet of growth canopy here um, by any means. No, but you have two buildings with two floors. And if you add it all up, there's 80,000 square feet of growing area. We have nothing proposed for the you know area to the north at this point. It's simply just labeled as expansion area. We don't have anything proposed at, the, at this point for that. It's simply the five greenhouses with the head house attached. I know, but it says uh, planned expansion or for expansion. So I assume you are going to try to expand and double the size of what you have in the first building. Yeah, I think, again, that is our eventual plan. We don't have any plans for that at this stage in the game. Well, I really think that the Zoning Board of Appeals should understand that is your eventual plan. Yeah, we were granted a host agreement for 100,000 square feet on the site. So uh, we, we do intend to maximize that. Certainly extend. Uh, so all I want is clarity. To get to that. What, sure. what were the plans? that follow those two maps for? I'm not following your question, I apologize. Well, there are two squares on the second map that you showed, apparently. These contain your head house and, well, the first one, the head house and the five greenhouses. Now, if you turn the page, the next page, I believe, I don't have it in my hand right now, uh, shows a floor plan for that building. And that floor plan looks very, very similar to what you have drawn on the map, showing the area where you wish to demolish buildings, as well as the area on which you plan to build. Uh, maybe I could maybe I could jump in. I'm not I'm not sure what we're we're trying to to clarify here, but but just to reiterate that the greenhouses for for your understanding are, are one story one story greenhouses. The the building that's shown in as a preliminary concept is uh, is shown um, with the necessary program and and will comply with with zoning height restrictions. Now similar to the the house that's there now, um, and that, and that's so that's what. 
You are saying then that you would abandon all the plans that follow that map and you will propose new plans. Is that correct? No, we, what I think what, what we're saying here is we're saying that we're, we're, we're hoping to secure a variance and then come back with better engineering and more robust engineering in connection with a special permit application. Well, we'd like well, to, I, can under, I can understand that. I think what we'd like to demonstrate to, to the public and to the board is what the concept is here um, of, of, the new, of the new structures. I can't be adverse to that. So it's uh, almost 10, well, there's 10 after 10. Um, my personal view is I don't want to vote tonight. I do want to read this Johnson case. I want to see if there's support in the law for uh, this type of a variance. So that's, that's my own personal feeling. Do the other board members want to chime in and see where they are? At the I would, I would pr prefer to have a little more time and, and perhaps Roger, you can share that case. Yes, of course I would, yes. I, I agree. So Thank then, you. Then what we're going to do is uh, continue this hearing to uh, October 7th, and this will be the third hearing uh, that night. Uh, and so therefore, 7.45 will be the start time. And, uh, uh, could I address a question to the board uh, before we adjourn? Sure. Um, if the board is going to be taking this into consideration, uh, in the interim, would we be able to submit a, uh, a special permit application, assuming the variance were to be granted, that would uh, more accurately detail uh, the planned buildings um, and hopefully address some of the concerns regarding those? Well, this is a unique case. There's nothing that prohibits you from submitting a special permit application. <laughs> Nothing that I'm aware of. So my answer would be, yes, you could. Would they have to? Would they have to um, apply for a special permit? I think that's what he's saying. Is that what you're right. saying? So bring in. So you'd have to. Um, we'd have to advertise and such. Yeah. Well, I think some of the the questions and concerns of the community were uh, addressed to the specific buildings and what what exactly was going up. No, and, uh, I, I absolutely understand that and I appreciate that. I'm just wondering from a legal standpoint, do you have to make a new application for a special permit? Do we have to advertise it? Do we have enough time to do that? Uh, well, that, that was part of my question to the board is if the variance were granted, um, should we have a special permit uh, submitted so that they could, act, so you would be able to act on the special permit allowing this use if the variance were granted? And just to interject, and Devin, correct me if I'm wrong, and Andrea, um, I believe I've seen this, but perhaps the board would want to amend the uh, the current special permit as part of the you know, optimistically uh, approving, if, if we're you know fortunate enough to have the variance approved, the special permit currently in place would be amended with uh, revised plans. That would be a big amendment. <laughs> leave it for the, your council to figure out what the best strategy is. There's nothing that prohibits you from filing an additional special permit request. There's nothing that prohibits you from formally asking us to amend a special permit. There's no guarantee that we would act on either of those on the same night of October 7th. So you're free to utilize the procedures that exist. Thank you. You're welcome. Andrew, may I ask a question? Yes. What, I'm going to butter. Um, can I ask what the role of the planning board is and uh, have the petitioners figured out when they're going back? I presume that would have to happen. The site plan would have changed, will be changing, I presume. So in a variance, in a variance uh, application, that's strictly zoning board of appeals territory. 
planning board has no particular role in that uh, or no role at all. The um, site plan application would be required with a, in conjunction with a special permit application. So yes, they would have to go back to the planning board. That's the usual any approach. Sorry, go ahead, Indra. Sorry. I was gonna say that that is the usual approach. That's the approach I would expect. Yeah. Is there any opportunity for a meeting sooner? <clears throat> well, to be honest, we've had our hands full this, this calendar year with a lot of applications. We have a lot of work to do. We've got a view in the, in the next couple of weeks. We've got to write up the decisions that we've made. So. I'm going to stick with our monthly schedule. I think that's fair to our volunteer board like ourselves. The reason I ask is just we're, we're approaching the, the winter and we, you know, our goal is obviously construction as soon as possible here so we can get hit the ground running. So um, we lose a month here. It hurts pretty good here. So if you consider that, we'd appreciate it. But I understand your volunteer role and respect your decision. Well, what we try to do is write it up if we, are inclined to grant the variance application, we can try to write it up as quickly as we can. Right now we're running at least 30 days behind in writing anything up. Whereas in the past, when we had live meetings, we would almost universally write up our decisions on the same night that we voted. So, so there's that too. I have our answer, no. Okay, All right, so, so I, don't want to, I don't want to continue with a series of questions and go around the block one more time. So we're going to adjourn until... Uh, October 7th, we'll see you then.